Hello guys, how are you all? Welcome back to my channel. So, today we are gonna see, what if Naruto and Tenten fall in love and have child, part 1, subscribe if you enjoy the video, and also check the description. So let's begin the story. It was just after dinner time at the orphanage in Konoha. Five-year-old Naruto has just finished his measly dinner and has gone back to his room. It is the smallest room in the orphanage, except for the closets. There is a mattress on the floor, otherwise it's bare. There is one blanket, but it's so threadbare that it doesn't really count for much. He curls up on the old mattress, trying to keep warm. It's winter in Konoha, and although it isn't snowing, it's bitterly cold out. Surprisingly, though, Naruto isn't especially cold. The room is drafty, especially at the moment, since there was currently a large thunderstorm over Konoha, and the old window didn't close right. He's content, though, since the other children tend to leave him alone there. Just as he's about to fall asleep, though, he hears a bunch of noise coming from downstairs. As he listens, he hears the orphanage lady arguing about something, and he manages to catch the word storm orphanage and collapsed. Turns out, one of the other orphanages had sustained damage in the storm, and part of the roof had collapsed, and the workers there had decided that it wasn't safe to stay, so they had brought the children there to the orphanage that Naruto was in. Naruto suddenly hears footsteps approaching his room. He looks over at the door, and the old lady who runs the orphanage sticks her head in, still talking to whoever is in the hallway. I'm sorry, but this is the only other room that has space at the moment. I really don't want to put anyone in the same room as him, but we don't really have a choice. There isn't anywhere else. Naruto remains still. As much as he wanted to know what was going on, he knew it was better to remain quiet, since he was less likely to get punished that way. Boy, Brad, some stuff happened at one of the other homes, so you got a roommate now. Behave, you hear. Hi, Obasan he said quietly, knowing better than to disrespect this woman, since she was the one in charge of his food. Anyways, this is Tenten, and she will be staying with you for the time being, got it? If I hear about you doing anything bad, you'll not eat for a week. Hi, Obasan he said again, as the woman allowed a girl to enter the room. She was about the same size that he was, and had her hair done up in two buns. She had a Chinese-style shirt on, and dark green pants. Hi, my name is Tenten. Who are you? I'm Naruto. As Tenten walked into the room, the old woman stepped out, shutting the door. Since Tenten was wide awake after having to walk in the storm, they sat up for a while talking about each other. Turns out that Tenten was a year older than Naruto, and both of them didn't really have any friends. Naruto didn't have any cause, all the adults kept the other kids away from him, and Tenten didn't have any since all the kids were afraid she would beat them up. Tenten was quite the young tomboy, after all. Eventually, Tenten fell asleep, lying across the mattress. He tucked the worthless blanket around her and curled up on the floor next to the bed. A couple hours later, he was awoken by a particularly loud bit of thunder, and just as he was about to fall back asleep, he heard a chattering sound. At first, he thought the noise was coming from outside, but as he lay there on the floor, he realized that the sound was coming from Tenten, who was shivering violently under the worthless blanket. Prodding her awake, he asked, you okay? Once she focused on him, she chirped out, cold. He reached his hand out to touch her arm, and once he made contact, his hand recoiled almost instantly. She was as cold as an ice cube. While he was in shock over how cold she was, she realized that he was warm. Warm she shivered out. Huh? Warm, you warm. Huh? I'm warm. Yeah, I know that. I'm trying to figure out how to make you warm too he said. Eventually, Tenten got tired of listening to him think, and did what she thought was the most logical thing to do. She grabbed Naruto and stuck him on the side of the mattress closest to the window. Hey, what was that for? I'm cold. You're warm. Shut up and lie down she told him, using as forceful a tone of voice as a shivering six-year-old girl can. Confused, Naruto just agreed with her and lay down next to her. She then flopped back down and scooted as close to him as she could get, pressing her back into his chest. Naruto then started to panic since he didn't really understand what was going on and was about to scoot off the bed when she grabbed him. Stop moving. You're gonna stay here and keep me warm. Wherever you scoot off to, I'm just gonna follow you, but I wanna stay on the bed. It's more comfortable here. Any questions? I didn't think so she said, scooting back up against his chest without allowing him to answer. Naruto just lay there, not moving, until her bare foot came into contact with his leg, which made him scream from the shock. Once he got over the shock, he went back to not moving, since he really didn't know what he was supposed to be doing. Wanting to get more comfortable, and since Naruto didn't have a pillow in his room, she grabbed one of his arms and extended it under her head, giving her something to sleep on. Naruto tensed at the action, but eventually relaxed. Eventually, they both drifted off to sleep, all thoughts of the storm forgotten. When Naruto woke up, the first thing he noticed was that he was a lot warmer than he normally was when he woke up. 
Next, he realized that he was very comfortable, followed by realizing that there was something on his right arm, preventing him from moving it, and that his left arm was wrapped around something. When he opened his eyes, all he could see was brown, and after a minute or so of processing all the incoming information, as well as recalling the night's events, he realized that the brown was the back of Tenton's head, and that she was using his arm as a pillow. His left arm was thrown over her left side, with his hand resting near her stomach. But, before he could really begin to enjoy being like that, the old lady who ran the orphanage, started banging on the door to wake them up, thus ruining the moment. The two kids reluctantly climbed out of the bed, and went about their morning activities. This process went on for a couple weeks, with Naruto and Tenten sharing a room, and occasionally the bed, at night. During the day, they played together, since nobody else would play with them. They had to be careful, though, and not let the old lady catch them, since no one was supposed to pay with the demon child. Eventually, they realized that if it looked like Tenten was always beating Naruto up, they left the both of them alone. One day, while Tenten was beating Naruto up the orphanage lady called over to Naruto, breaking his concentration, and thus causing him to not avoid a punch from Tenten, leaving her with a sore hand, and him with a sore face. Hi, Obasan Naruto called out, rubbing his sore cheek. The Hokage is here to see you. Hurry up and get yourself in here. And what have I told you about fighting? Omen, Obasan Naruto said as he ran into the orphanage's living room. Tenten just stared after him, deciding to follow him after a moment, since she had nothing better to do. As soon as Naruto made it into the living room, he launched himself at the old man, catching him around the waist in a bone crunching, for a five-year-old, anyway, hug. Hi Jiji. Are you here to take me to go get Raymond? Sure, Naruto, we can go get some Raymond, but only a couple bowls. I have a lot of paperwork to do, remember Sirotobi replied, laughing. Before Naruto could answer though, Tenten came running into the room, Naruto, where'd you go? I'm not done beating you up yet. Boy Tenten. Jiji's gonna take me out for Raymond. Naruto, was she really beating you up the Hokage asked. Naruto just motioned the old man to bend over and leaned in close to his ear, whispering, no, Jiji, but as long as Tenten pretends to beat me up all day, everybody leaves us alone. Nobody else plays with us and it's kinda fun too. We just pretend we're ninjas. Saratobi jumped back from the assault on his eardrums, since Naruto had yelled out the last bit, and asked, well, Tenten, would you like to get some Raymond with us? Really? She can come too. You're awesome Jiji. I don't know. I never had Raymond before. What's it taste like she asked. It's only the awesomest food ever. Okay, I'll try it. After Saratobi informed the orphanage workers that he was taking the two of them out for a while, they departed for Naruto's second favorite place. Along the way, Naruto never stopped talking. He asked Saratobi all sorts of questions, ranging from his shoe size, Saratobi wore 11s, to when he could go to the ninja academy, next year, to when he could wear his hat, when he made Hokage. Having had that line of questioning shot down, he next launched into what had happened to him since the old man had last visited, which was the day before Tenten came to his orphanage. Saratobi frowned when Naruto described his room, and decided that it was time Naruto got out of there. He was not frowning for long, though, as a smile was quickly brought out as he listened to the hyperactive blonde describe some adventure he went on. Naruto was still talking when they got to Ichiraku's, although he was allowing Tenten into the conversation more often. It was fine with her, since she didn't really know who the guy was, besides the fact that Naruto liked him. She knew he was the Hokage, she just didn't know what a Hokage was. As soon as they entered the Raymond stand, Naruto immediately switched over to talking to the old man there, not even pausing to take a breath. It amazed the girl how easily he brought the old man behind the counter into his conversation, about what, Tenten wasn't sure, and just blew her away, when the old man just followed Naruto as he talked, a skill that Tenten still lacked. Sure, she could keep up fine when it was just the two of them, but in their present company. Naruto made lifelong auctioneers look like mimes, he could talk so fast. So, Ten-chan, what kind of Raymond do you want Naruto ask as he clambered onto a stool. A Tenten had been so into admiring how fast he could talk that she missed his question. I said, what kind of Raymond do you want? Ah oh, no, what kinds are there? Naruto opened his mouth to respond, but Sirotobi cut him off, just take a miso. If you let Naruto get going on all the kinds of Raymond there are, you'll be my age before he finishes. Naruto glared at the old man for cutting off his rant, I want too large miso. Oh? Didn't you just eat lunch, Naruto? Yeah, but they never give him enough, so I'm still hungry the boy replied. This just reaffirmed his decision to get Naruto out of the orphanage. I'll take the usual, Tuchi-san. Hi, Hokage-sama, and for you the man asked, looking at Tenten. Ah oh, no, a small miso, please. Their orders were brought out in short order, and Naruto immediately started inhaling his, until he remembered that Tenten was trying it for the first time. He saw her take a bite, and asked, well, isn't it the best food ever? It's pretty good, but I think I like Dango better. Naruto just grumbled and went back to inhaling his ramen. 
Once they finished, Saratobi took them back to the orphanage, since he had to go finish his neglected paperwork. The next time Naruto saw the old man was about a week later, and much to the old man's surprise, Naruto didn't come shooting out to greet him as soon as he showed up. Saratobi had to actually go to his room to get him, and what he saw made him both angry and sad. Angry for the state of his room, and sad because Naruto was curled up in the corner, all miserable looking. The old man just quietly walked in, closed the door, and crouched down next to him. What's wrong, Naruto? Naruto looked up at the old man, and Saratobi could tell he was just managing to hold his tears in. Ten-chan had to go back to the other orphanage today. Now I have nobody to play with Naruto told him quietly, his voice wavering. Saratobi gave off a quiet smile, well, Naruto, I can't help with that, but I do have a present for you. Really he asked quietly, yeah. Come on, I'll go show it to you. Saratobi led Naruto across the village, taking him to the other side of the poor area of the village, from where the orphanage was. He led Naruto into a slightly beat up looking apartment building, stopping in front of a door on the top floor. Who lives here, Jiji Naruto asked him. You do, Naruto the Hokage replied, handing him a set of keys. This is your new home. It's not much, but I think you like it here better than at the orphanage. Naruto just held the keys in shock, the situation not really sinking in. Eventually the emotions of the day overwhelmed him, and tears started to silently work their way down his face, until he launched himself at the old man, catching him in a death grip hug, almost knocking them both over. When he finally managed to get some control over his emotions, he thanked the old man several times, and went inside. There were only two rooms, those being a small bathroom, and a larger room that was a combination of kitchen, living room, and bedroom, but to Naruto it was huge. He actually had a real bed, a closet, and even his own couch. He was so overwhelmed, he lost the little control he had gained over his emotions, and curled up against the hokage, and happily cried himself to sleep. It's been two years since Naruto got his apartment, and one year since he started attending the ninja academy. This day finds him in a rare bad mood, well, a visible bad mood. Naruto is actually in what could be considered a bad mood most of the time, especially on this day, October the 10th. Still, he usually manages to hide it behind a face-splitting grin and a carefree personality. This particular day, though, on top of it being October 10th, he was shot down by Sakura, again, failed his test, and tripped and fell into a giant mud puddle. Couple that with years of verbal abuse, neglect, widespread hatred, and living alone at the age of seven, and you can see why Naruto is letting his bad mood show. To top it all off, that night was the festival for celebrating the defeat of the Kaiubi, a night he greatly feared. He didn't fear it because of the Kaiubi. No, he feared it because the villagers were especially nasty towards him for some reason. Last year, some drunk people even chased him with broken beer bottles. He was so lost in self-pity that he forgot to activate his extra security measures when he got to his apartment. He didn't even lock the door. He just kicked it closed before walking over to his bed and collapsing on it, not even bothering to remove his sandals. Naruto's dream, 7-year-old Naruto sat on the swing outside the academy, watching as all the other kids were picked up by their parents. He watched as the parents hugged their children and asked about their children's day. He watched as the children hugged their parents back and walked off holding hands while telling them about what happened that day. He sat there alone, wishing someone would come for him. Wishing that someone would be waiting for him when he finished school, someone who he could hug and get hugs from, someone he could tell about his day. Hell, he'd be happy to have someone ground him, since it would mean that there was someone who cared enough about him to care that he did something wrong. The few friends he had, if you could call them that, all thought that not having parents was awesome, since he got to do whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted. All they did was complain that their parents were too strict, gave them too many chores, not enough free time, and made them do their homework. Naruto just pretended that not having parents was awesome, and laughed with them as they grumbled about their parents, all the while wishing that he could have some of his own. He didn't really blame them, though. They had no idea what it was like to be him, what it was like to be hated by almost everyone around him. They thought he got bad grades because he was stupid and lazy, and because he skipped class a lot. Of course what they didn't know was that his tests were covered with which changed the questions, which were removed before his tests were graded, therefore always making his answers wrong. He couldn't file a complaint, because those had to have a parent signature, and he didn't have any parents. Even if he could file a complaint, he doubted that they would read it. They would just laugh at him, asking him to prove it, while telling his Tejutsu teacher to rough him up a little. The only teacher who cared at all was Aruka, and even then he couldn't do much. That would be showing favoritism, and could get him in a lot of trouble. All of his other teachers hated him. The Tejutsu teacher beat him up, the ninjutsu teacher either used him as a target or ignored him, and on the rare occasion that he actually did show him something, he showed Naruto how to do it wrong. 
the teacher didn't even let him in his class anymore, and the weapons teacher purposely gave him the dullest set of kunai and shuriken in the village, which made it damn near impossible to get them to stick in a target. Hell, he'd probably have a better chance of making a bull's eye if he threw a cup of instant ramen at it. Because of this, and the fact that he didn't have any family styles to rely on, his ninjutsu sucked, his tajutsu was worse than a drunk three-year-old, and his was non-existent. He was actually good at throwing weapons, but since they didn't stick to the targets, his scores didn't count. Aruka's he did okay in, but that was mainly because Aruka taught history and wasn't actively sabotaging Naruto's efforts to learn. The only skill he was good at was Henge, and that's because Aruka taught him that when he was filling in for the normal teacher, who was out sick. He could pull off a short distance Kawarimi, although it was difficult, and couldn't make a decent bunch in to save his life. His chakra control was almost non-existent, while his reserves were huge, which only compounded his control problem. He couldn't read or write very well, and had problems counting past 50. He wore ugly orange jumpsuits because that was the only thing the village clothes shops would let him buy, since they figured it would be easier to find him if he wore bright neon orange. Even then, they charged him triple for the horrid things. His rent was obscenely high too. This left him with almost no money for food, so he ate a lot of instant ramen, not just because he liked it, but because it was cheap. Naruto was suddenly roused from his dream by someone banging on his door. He quickly sat up, grabbing the one sharp kunai he had, which was a present from Jai-chan on his last birthday. It came in a set, but the rest of them were stolen a short time later. He was unable to keep thinking about much of anything, since his door picked that moment to give in to the pounding and collapsed to the floor. Naruto looked over at the doorway, his eyes wide as he saw who had just hammered his door down. It wasn't just a couple drunk villagers, but a whole bunch of them. They swarmed into his small apartment, quickly cutting off all of Naruto's escape routes. Why are you here? He finally managed to scream out, what did I ever do to you? The demon thinks he's innocent. One of the villagers screamed out, can you believe it? You killed our families, you little shit another called out, so now we're gonna kill you. Wait. I'm only seven. I didn't kill anybody, I swear Naruto called out, trying to convince them that he was innocent. Yeah, like we're gonna believe a demon like you, good luck with it a third villager called out, enough talk, let's get him, I wanna go back to the festival. The mob of villagers swarmed the boy, beating him with whatever they could get their hands on. One even picked up a part of the broken door and stabbed him in the thigh with it, making Naruto scream out in pain. They beat him for another half hour, until a villager got bored kicking him in the face and decided to try something else. He picked up Naruto's discarded kunai and walked over to the boy, who was miraculously still conscious. You killed my parents, my wife, and my son, you nonsense. You made me have to carve their names into the memorial, so now I'm gonna carve them into you the man screamed before beginning to carve the names of his family onto Naruto's flesh. He was forced to stop briefly from Naruto struggling, but quickly solved that by tying him to the wall, arms and legs spread wide, so he couldn't struggle anymore. He then continued to carve the names of his family on Naruto's chest. When he ran out of family, he gave the kunai to the next villager in line, who began to carve the names of their deceased family into his flesh. After a while, when his front side was lacking an available space to carve, they turned him around and continued the process on his back. They were careful about how they did it too. As soon as they felt like Naruto was gonna pass out from the pain, they would stop for a while, letting him get used to the pain. When he finally did pass out, after a few hours and over 700 names, a couple showed up to see what was going on. What's going on here one of them asked. We're punishing the demon a villager replied. Oh, okay, just try to keep the noise down, the neighbors are complaining about all the screaming. It's fine, we're just about done with him anyway. We just gotta find a place to finish him off. Don't bother. We'll do it. That nonsense killed my sister, and I've wanted payback for a while now. I'll hit him with an academy fire, make it look like he burned this place down by practicing indoors. Yeah, kids these days, always screwing around the other replied. They then ferried all the villagers out of the building, and then returned to the destroyed apartment. The first was about to start the fire, but was stopped before he could finish it by the other dot. What? Is there anyone else in this building? I have no problem killing demons, but I don't want to be responsible for burning a bunch of civilians to death. Uh, I don't think so, but we should probably check. We're on the top floor, so the whole building shouldn't burn down, so long as we watch it. We'll just say we found the apartment on fire and quickly put it out, but were unable to save the poor child who lived there. They then scanned the surrounding apartments, finding them all empty. Seems that nobody wanted to live next to the demon. Oh well, it just makes our job easier thought one of the Chunins as they return to the demon's apartment. We'll both do it. Rumor has it that the demon has a lot of chakra and almost no control over it, so it'll be more realistic that way. Okay the other replied, as they both launched the unnamed fire at the demon's unconscious body, shooting an 8-foot flame at him. 
Normally, the technique only puts out a two-foot stream of flames, and it's used for lighting campfires and torches and such. But, when a couple of angry people are behind it and have chakra to spare, well, you can imagine the results. Especially when they use it inside a wooden apartment. Satisfied that the demon was taken care of, they waited on a nearby roof for an appropriate amount of time to pass before dousing the flames and playing the dog. When Naruto passed out from the pain, he found himself in a sewer, or at least, what he thought was a sewer. It was dark, and there was ankle-deep water on the floor. The next thing he realized was that he didn't hurt, and upon a closer inspection, realized that he had no injuries at all. Ha! Huh. I must be dead. Funny though, I thought heaven was supposed to be bright and sunny. The villagers must have got their wish and sent me to hell Naruto thought as he began to explore the sewer. As he walked, he noticed pipes running across the ceiling, big ones and small ones. The big ones faintly glowed red, and the little ones faintly glowed blue, and for some reason, their combined glow made a faint green light, which was how Naruto was able to see where he was going. The thing that unnerved him the most though, was the fact that he seemed to know where he was going, although he also knew that he had never been there before in his life. He was sure he would remember it if he had, and he couldn't remember ever being in a place like this. Continuing on, he noticed the air getting warmer, as well as there being more of the big pipes on the ceiling, and less of the little ones. Eventually, it got to the point where there weren't any little pipes on the ceiling, and as he turned the next corner, he came face to face with a giant cage. The cage went up towards where the ceiling should be, it was so high he couldn't actually see it. The bars were as thick as his arm, and spaced far enough apart for him to easily slide through, which told him that whatever was behind them was really big, and probably really strong. He was surprised, then, to find that the only thing holding the cage shut was a small piece of paper, with seal written on it. Once the novelty of the giant cage started to wear off, he began to notice a sound. It had a rather odd rhythm to it, until he realized that the sound was from something breathing, and based on that breathing, whatever it was, was waking up. Pretty soon, he could vaguely make out something moving in the darkness on the other side of the bars, and he could tell it was really, really, big. Big as in, bigger than his apartment, heck the thing was probably bigger than his apartment building. He just watched in awe as the thing began to move towards him, but staying far enough back that he couldn't tell what it was. Eventually, Naruto got sick of waiting and called out to it, hello. The only response he got was a pair of enormous eyes opening, each with a vertically slit pupil and colored red. Yep, that confirmed it. Whatever the thing was, it was huge. Who are you? The question caught Naruto completely off guard. Uh, I'm Yuzumaki Naruto. There was a brief pause, and then, how old are you? This time, he noticed the huge mouth the thing had, as well as the fact that it was full of very white, very shiny, and very sharp looking teeth. Uh, I'm seven. The thing turned slightly away from Naruto, and after a few minutes, Naruto decided to ask it some questions. Who are you Naruto asked. Me? You should know that already. You humans call me Kaiubi. Naruto's response came as a slight shock to Kaiubi, as he just flopped down onto the watery floor and began to think, which was a pretty far cry from the usual responses. Usually people screamed in fear, tried to attack, or just keeled over dead. You don't seem very surprised. Normally when humans hear my name they try to attack me. Why should I be? We're both dead already. Huh? Well, if you're the Kaiubi, and I can see you, we both must be dead. Cuz, like, the Yandame Hokage killed you, making you dead, and for me to see dead people means that I gotta be dead too. Kaiubi just stared at Naruto. It was a surprisingly well thought out argument from a 7 year old human, based on the edited bit of knowledge he had. You're not dead, or at least not yet. I'm not dead either. I don't know why you think it, but this Yandame Hokage didn't kill me, he sealed me inside you. I'm the Lord of Demons, no pathetic human can kill me. Naruto just sat there in shock, not really able to process what he was just told. As the silence stretched on, Kaiubi was beginning to think that Naruto's mind had cracked when he suddenly spoke. So you're why everyone hates me? Everyone hates you? Yeah. All the villagers glare at me and call me names like Demon and Monster. None of the shops sell me stuff and none of the other kids play with me. Whenever I try to play with them, their parents yell at me and take them away. That made Kaiubi angry. No demon disrespects children. In the course of its life, even Kaiubi avoided killing children whenever possible. What about your parents? I don't have any. I lived at the orphanage until Jai-chan got me this apartment. Something about that sentence just didn't sound right to Kaiubi. Lived. Yeah. Jai-chan got sick of the people there abusing me and stuff. They said that a demon should be able to live on its own and that they shouldn't have to take care of me. They went silent for a few minutes, Kaiubi thinking over how wrong Naruto's life was and Naruto trying to figure out where they were. So, where are we? Hmm? Oh, this is your mindscape. What? We're inside your mind. Oh how Naruto was cut off when it suddenly got really hot in his mind. What's going on? Kaiubi just focused on Naruto's senses and came to a startling conclusion. 
Their body is on fire. Their body is on fire. It is Naruto said, as he looked at himself, I don't look like I'm on fire. Not here, your real body is on fire, along with whatever building you were in. What? Yeah, you're on fire, and unless you want to burn to death, I suggest you hurry and get back out there and get out of the fire. That had a sobering effect on Naruto, which surprised the fox. I can't. What do you mean, you can't? Well, you can see outside, look for yourself Naruto shouted, unable to actually say what had been done to him. But the fox found almost made a wretch. It couldn't believe what had happened to him, or the fact that he wasn't dead yet. Who, did that? A bunch of villagers broke in and did that he said quietly, every year they chase me on this day, and I usually spend it locked in my apartment. But today a lot of stuff happened, and was so out of it that I forgot about them. But why this day? Cause it's the festival celebrating when the Yande Mhokage defeated you. All the villagers have a huge party, and even the ninjas go dotty went silent for a moment, and it's my birthday. Hayubi's heart went out to the child. Having to spend one's birthday locked inside their apartment alone while in fear of their life was not the way a child should be raised. Not even the vilest of demons did that to their children. It just wasn't right. I can help you, if you let me. How? If you channel chakra into that seal, it will allow me to gain some control over your body, and I will be able to move it out of the fire. But I can't reach it Naruto said. As soon as he finished, though, it slid right down to the bottom, stopping about even with his chest. And I can't really do much with my chakra yet. That doesn't matter. You know how to move chakra in your body right? Naruto nodded. Well, that seal is technically a part of your body. Just focus it there. You don't need much, just enough to tell the seal that you know what's going on. Naruto didn't really get why he needed to put the chakra into the seal, he just knew that it was his only real hope of getting out of his burning apartment alive. So he placed both of his hands on the seal and began pushing chakra into it. It wasn't very much, since he really didn't know what he was doing, but it was enough to let Kaiubi move his body. When Kaiubi's chakra connected with Naruto's motor functions, the shock almost kicked his chakra out. The pain coming from his body was beyond intense. Back in the burning apartment, Naruto's body, or what was left of it, started to stir. First, the whisker marks on his face darkened. His finger and toenails lengthened, along with his canine teeth. His eyelids opened, revealing red eyes with slitted pupils. Suddenly, a cocoon of red chakra enveloped his body, protecting it from the flames. The Kaiubi-driven body of Naruto then proceeded to crawl its way over to his window, which had broken from the intense heat, and managed to pitch himself out of the window, falling four stories to the alley below. He landed in a heap and did not move, the crimson cocoon fading shortly thereafter. Saratobi was relaxing in his office, paperwork finally completed for the day. He had just pulled out a certain orange book when he felt a chakra pulse. Now, this was by no means a reason for him to freak out, since he felt chakra pulses all day, as did everyone else who could sense chakra while living in a ninja village. No, the reason this particular chakra pulse made him drop his book on his desk and file his age body out the window was who the chakra belonged to. Or rather, what it belonged to. He hadn't felt that particular chakra signature in seven years, and while this pulse was very small, its very presence filled him with worry. Was the seal broken? Was Naruto alright? Could the fox escape? These were only some of the thoughts flying around his head as he raced towards Naruto's apartment, becoming more alarmed by the second as he saw smoke coming from that direction. The Zanbu bodyguard squad fell into place around him shortly thereafter, and he began to bark out orders, Inu, Nizumi, Risu, go ahead and find out what's wrong. Tora, go alert the hospital, I have a feeling Naruto's gonna need a bed there. I don't care how you do it, get a competent team ready for him. If they still won't, send them to Ibiki, no restrictions. Hi, Hokage-sama they all shouted out, before splitting off in their separate directions. Of the three Anbu going to the fire, Inu was in the lead, flanked by Nizumi, Mouse, on the left, and Risu, Squirrel, on the right. Risu Inu barked out, take care of the fire. Nizumi, look for anyone around here who seems to be taking too much interest in the fire, make note of them, and send the list to the Hokage. I look for the kid. Hi, Senpai they both returned, before leaping off to take care of their assigned tasks. Inu didn't even make all the way around the building before he found a body in the alley behind the building. He noticed the broken window belching flames from the top floor. He jumped out of the four-story window. In that condition. He quickly moved him to check for a pulse. And he's still alive. He scooped up the battered body, and right before he leapt off, Saratobi arrived. How is he? He's alive at the moment. Can't really tell much else though the doubly masked Nin replied. Oh. Tora should have the hospital set by now. When you get there, I want the both of you to watch over him. Once he's stable, only let people you trust near him. Should there be any problems, do whatever you have to, to keep him safe. I'm failing Minato's last wish is bad enough as it is, I will not let the villagers kill him. 
Hi, Hokujama Inu said, before vanishing off towards the hospital, going as fast as he could, while trying not to further aggravate Naruto's injuries. When Inu arrived at the hospital, there was a team of medians waiting outside the building for him. He quickly handed the boy over to them, before following them into the emergency section, Tora right behind him. As they passed through the lobby, Inu was mildly surprised to only see three doctors in heaps against the wall. Inu looked at Tora, raising an eyebrow behind his mask. They said no replied Tora. Ah. As they reached the emergency section, a nurse tried to halt their progress, but a glare from the two masked nins silenced her even before she began to speak. Once inside the room, they quietly stood in a corner, watching over the meanings as they worked on the boy. Several hours later, Saratobi finally made it to the hospital and found Tora standing outside Naruto's door. When he went in, he found Inu sitting next to Naruto's bed. He still had his mask on, but the left eye hole was closed and his hood was down, revealing his gravity-defying silver-white hair. How is he? Inu just pulled back the sheet. From waist to neck, Naruto was wrapped in bandages. His left arm and both legs were in casts, since he broke them when he fell out of his window. His hair was gone, as were his eyebrows. The upper half of his right arm was bandaged as well. Well, it's not just burns, Hokujama. The villagers cut him up. They cut him up badly. Dottie produced a scroll from one of his pockets, handing it over. The villagers carved names of the Kaiubi attack victims into his skin. That scroll has the ones they could read on it, but they overlap so much it's probably nowhere close to all of them. They could only read about 30 or so, but based on the amount of area that they couldn't make out, it's probably closer to a couple hundred names. Saratobi just collapsed into a chair, what about the burns? Thankfully not as bad as they looked. Most were concentrated on his back and left arm. Mainly second degree, although there was some third. Left arm and both legs are broken, most likely from falling out of his window. And the seal. Still good as far as I can tell. I got a quick look at it before they wrapped him up, and it didn't look any different, and I can only sense a tiny amount of other chakra in his system right now, although I can't tell what it's from. It doesn't seem to be doing any damage, though, so it's probably leftovers from the medics. They say when he might wake up. Well, they got him on some pretty strong stuff right now. I'd tell you what it is, but I don't feel like trying to pronounce it. The name of the stuff is like 15 syllables long. Once he's off that stuff, it could be anywhere from a day to never, they just don't know. Thanks for watching over him. I'll make sure your team gets a beer rank for this. Nizumi and Risu will take over for you in a few hours. Oh, before I forget, how many? You'd have to ask him, but when I got here, there were only three on the floor unconscious. The medians were even waiting outside for us. I'll make sure to do so. Please, if anything changes, let me know. Ah. Pakin knows that I may call on him at any moment. As the aging Hokage left, Inu couldn't help but hang his head at how bad his village had failed his teacher. Gomen, Sensei. It would seem that the village is too stupid to see him for what he really is. Back in Naruto's mind, he was having a rather interesting conversation with the fox. Meaning, he was walking it through his memories, which was not fun. The fun and interesting part came from the fox's comments on everything. That managed to take the edge off the bad memories, especially when the fox called the orphanage lady, open.witchy, old hag, when they finished, the fox was beyond shocked that the boy in front of her had gone through what he had and come out the way he did. So when do I get to wake up Naruto asked the fox. Not for a while. Your body is pretty messed up right now. You're better off staying here for a while. How bad is it? Well, you're wrapped in bandages from neck to waist, along with half of your right arm, and the rest of your limbs are in casts from falling out of your window. I'm sending my chakra out to help fix what I can, but I really don't know much about human bodies, so it's going pretty slow. Besides, they got you stuck on some pretty powerful sedatives and painkillers right now, so you probably couldn't wake up, even if you wanted to. Oh dot Naruto got another defeated look, as he sighed heavily. Kaiubi had come to hate that look. It just seemed so dot wrong for a child to wear a look like that, especially one that was as energetic as he was. It affected the fox on some inner primal level, to do whatever it could to fix the problem. The main issue with that being that the fox knew almost nothing about human emotions, and knew even less about how to influence them. So, the fox thought about it from a different perspective, that being what it would do if Naruto was another demon in the same situation. Suddenly the fox had the urge to hold him, which completely confused it. Kaiubi was the lord of all demons, after all. It wasn't supposed to have feelings for humans besides what the best way to kill them was. Still, though, that urge just wouldn't go away. Deciding that it was some sort of long dormant parental instinct, since it had been a few hundred years since Kaiubi had children, the fox decided that it could handle these strange feelings. It then realized that its current form wasn't exactly the best suited for the task at hand, so the fox decided to shift. Naruto the fox called out, getting the child's attention. What? Come here, I want to show you something. 
Naruto stood up and walked up to the cage. You're not gonna eat me or anything, are you? Why would I do that? Humans taste really bad. Oh. Cause the stories all say that demons like to eat people. No, I'm not gonna eat you. Or do anything like that, either. Oh, okay, that's good. What are you gonna show me? This the fox replied, before starting to glow a dull red. The glow gave Naruto the chance to see the giant fox fully for the first time, even the nine tails waving around behind it. Suddenly though, the fox began to shrink, until it wasn't that much bigger than he was. As it did, the glow got brighter, until Naruto had to look away. When he looked back, he almost didn't believe what he was seeing. The person on the other side of the bars was about five and a half feet tall, with crimson hair that went down to the person's shoulder blades, with two white tipped ears sticking out the top. There were nine white tipped crimson tails behind them, and they were wearing a silver kimono. The person's face had a slightly feral look to it, which wasn't helped by the slightly longer than normal canine teeth poking out the sides of their mouth. None of that is what Naruto noticed, though. Him being him, he shouted out the first thing he did notice. You're a girl. What, is that a problem? Bear? No, not really. I just thought that you were a boy. Why would you think that? Well, you kinda sound like one when you're a fox, and all the stories say that you're a boy. Well I assure you, I am most definitely a woman. So, would you show me this? I don't really know. It just seemed like the right thing to do. Ever since you showed up here and woke me up, I've been getting these strange feelings, and they only got worse after I saw your memories. She could tell that reliving all of his memories was taking its toll on him, regardless of how well he tried to hide it. I'm having these urges to do things that I would otherwise never ever think about doing. Oh? Like what? Come here and I'll show you. Naruto slowly walked over to the fox woman, slipping easily through the bars of her prison. When he got close enough to her, she slowly put her arms around him. When he started to speak, she just shushed him. You do a remarkable job hiding your true feelings from the world, but you need to let them out. Having just seen your memories, I can tell that you have bottled up far more than is healthy. You need to let it out. So that's what he did. He let himself be held by the law. The doctors of Kanoha kept Naruto sedated for a full week, and he remained unconscious for a further week due to influence from the fox. During this time, the fox was slowly healing his injuries, or at least trying to, as well as helping him get over all of his bottled up emotions, including those in regards to housing her. She did not really enjoy that part of Naruto's impromptu therapy. He ranted and screamed at her, most of the time making no sense at all, for a whole day, before he collapsed into her arms, sobbing. In his hospital room, Inu and his squad kept a constant vigil over him, both to announce when he woke up and to protect him from any further harm. For Naruto's benefit, no attempts were made. Tuchi and AM dropped in to visit him, as did Tenten a few times after class got out at the academy. Naruto's teacher, Haruka, also stopped by the first day, but only stayed long enough to get enough information to satisfy his classmates, although none of them asked about the boy. The Hokage stopped by every day on his way home to check on Naruto, as well as get the report from the Anbu there. Every day, he left both happier and sadder. Happier that there were no attacks, and sadder because Naruto was still unconscious. He was also slightly worried about the constant, albeit small, amount of Kyuubi's chakra that was in his system. It did not seem to be doing anything to harm him, so the doctors hypothesized that it was some sort of innate power of protecting the host. It was just about to turn into the third week when Naruto finally started to wake up. The doctor had just finished a basic checkup on the boy and was in the process of writing a note to have him move to the coma ward when his assistant suddenly stopped him from writing. Wait, I think it's too soon to send him to the coma ward. Why? He's been out of it for two solid weeks, one without any influence from our medication. Because I just saw him move. Alert the Anbu outside. I'm sure Hokage-sama will want to know the instant Naruto wakes up. The assistant told the Anbu that Naruto seemed to be waking up, they had dropped it to one guard outside the room, and the guard swiftly sent out two clones. One headed for the Hokage, and the other headed for his team leader, Inu. Before long, both men came into the small recovery room, crowding it even further. Is it true Suratobi asked, sitting in the chair next to the bed, is he waking up? Inu stood in the corner, trying to stay out of everyone's way. We think so. He moved a little while ago, and that's more than he has since he got here. I was about to pronounce him comatose. The Hokage frowned slightly at the doctor, but it quickly vanished to be replaced with a smile when Naruto groaned and began to open his eyes. Naruto had been sitting with the fox for two weeks when she finally told him he could wake up. As soon as she had spoken, Naruto had almost flung himself out of his mind, only to crash headlong into the wall of pain that was his still healing body. He tried again, this time going a lot slower, trying to get used to the pain. A lot of the burns were gone, but he still had a broken arm and two broken legs to deal with. His first post-incident words, although they were barely audible, would be forever ingrained into the Hokage's memory. The first thing out of Naruto's mouth was, after a groan of pain, shoulder locked the door. 
Well, that certainly explained how the rioters got into his apartment, in any case. Tsuritobi just sighed in relief. As far as he was concerned, Naruto was okay. He gave Naruto some water, and once he was convinced that the boy was fully awake, began to ask him about the incident. Naruto, can you tell me where you are? The hospital, Jai-chan. Do you remember why you are here? I got attacked Naruto replied, before hanging his head and staring at his lap. Naruto, it wasn't your fault. You did nothing wrong. The villagers. Are misguided in their hate of you. It's because of the fox, isn't it? Naruto asked quietly, shocking everybody in the room. What do you mean? Saratobi asked slowly, not wanting to give anything away to the boy. They hate because of the fox and me, right? Did they tell you that? Naruto just shook his head. Then who told you that there is a fox inside you? The fox and me told me. That's why I have this seal, right? Naruto asked, pointing to his stomach. You spoke dot dot to the fox, the old man asked, slumping back in his chair. Yeah, she's actually really nice. You act wait, you said she. Yeah, the Kyubi fox is a girl. It surprised me too, cause when she's all big and foxy looking she kinda sounds like a boy, but when she turned into a person she was a girl, even though she had ears on top of her head and tails behind her Naruto said, waving his arms around for emphasis. Naruto, do you know how to do henge yet the Hokage asked. Uh, not really Naruto replied. The Hokage then reached into his pocket and pulled out a pen and some paper, before scribbling something down on it and handing it to Risu. Go find this man and have him be here at the earliest time he can. Risu nodded and then poofed out of the room. Where's he going, Jai-chan Naruto asked. He's going to find a man who works for the civilian police force. The man is a professional sketch artist who draws pictures of criminals based on what the victims see. So why do you need him? I want you to tell him about how the fox looked and he's going to draw a picture of it, air, her, so we can all see what she looks like. Oh, okay. The rest of the day was spent answering questions that Naruto had from what had happened, which weren't very many, and Suratobi in turn telling Naruto about the laws he made regarding the fox. Before the old man could leave though, Naruto had a rather odd request. Dai-chan, I have another question. Yes Naruto. Can I have an Anadi my book? Why do you want an anatomy book? Well, Kayubi-chan says that she can use her chakar, she can. That's what she said Naruto replied. And you trust her? Yeah, she's really nice to me. You should meet her sometime, I think you'd like her too. Naruto, there's no way wait, maybe there is. I will see if I can try to find you an anatomy book, but I want to meet her first, okay. We'll do it tomorrow after the artist leaves. The next day found Naruto inhaling his crappy hospital breakfast as the Hokage and the artist showed up. Naruto, this is Minoru. He's going to ask you some questions about what you saw, and he's going to draw a picture. He'll show you when he's done, and then you get to tell him what he did wrong, and how to fix it, okay. Minoru got comfortable, pulling Naruto's table up to him, after his dishes were cleared off, and began his questions. Well, Naruto-kun, everyone knows what the fox looks like when it's a fox, so we're gonna make a picture when she's a girl, okay. Okay. Now, how tall was she? Use us to compare if you have to. Naruto thought about it for a few seconds, before holding his hand against his stomach, I came up to about here on her. The questions went on for a while, and Naruto answered them as best he could. By the time Minoru had asked them all, it was time for lunch. While Naruto and the Hokage ate, he finished up his picture and showed it to Naruto. Does this look like what you saw he asked. Naruto pointed out a couple of small things that needed to be changed and then told him it was good. It was not what the old man was expecting. The woman on the page almost looked like she came from one of Jureya's books. Well, I guess I'll get to find out in a little while he thought, as he thanked Minoru for his time. Well, Naruto, are you ready to introduce me to Kayubi-chan? Well, yeah, but how are you gonna get inside my head place where she is? Well, Naruto, there is a room in the tower that can let other people into the mindscapes of others. It has special seals in it he told Naruto. It was entirely true, he just left out the part where the person being visited was usually an enemy nin that had been captured. They had a nurse carefully put Naruto in a wheelchair, and the Hokage wheeled him over to the tower and into the basement, to the secondary mind viewing room. This one was mainly used for looking into the mind of the interrogator, to view the memories of the one being interrogated. The primary room was buried underneath Anbu headquarters and was not near as nice as this one. Once Naruto was put in the right spot, he was told to relax, and when he felt like he was going to fall asleep, to just go with it and fall asleep. It didn't take long, and Naruto soon found himself back in his mindscape, along with the Hokage, who was quite shocked at what he saw. He was no expert, but this was the creepiest mind he had ever been in, including Ibiki's. Come on, Jai-chan, this way Naruto said, grabbing the old man's hand and leading him off through the maze of tunnels. It took the old man all of about a minute to get completely lost, although Naruto knew exactly where they were going, and about a minute later they got to the room with the cage. Naruto just walked right up to it, calling out, Kaiubi-chan. Jai-chan wants to meet you. 
come here. He didn't stop there, though. He kept on going, sliding in between the bars to continue his search, an act that almost gave old Sirotobi a heart attack. Naruto. Where are you going? Get back out here. Jill out Jai chan I've been back here already. I already asked if Kaiubi-chan was gonna eat me and she said no. She said that we taste yucky. Now come on, help me find her. Suddenly, a huge red eye opened up while Naruto was looking at the Hokage, and when he turned back, it was the first thing he saw. He screamed, falling onto his backside, don't do that. You scared me. I'm sorry, I just couldn't help it. Saratobi just stood outside the bars of the cage in absolute shock, as the mighty fox stood up and walked closer to the bars. Who are you? That's Jai-chan. He wanted to meet you, so here we are. The fox then shifted to her human form, since it was more appropriate for the situation. I am Saratobi Hiruzen, Sandane Hokage of Kanahagakur no Sado. You're this boy's grandfather? No, he just calls me that. Naruto has no true family at all, so I guess that I've sort of taken over the grandfather position. Who is responsible for this child? Well, technically nobody is, he is in charge of himself. But, myself and a few others check up on him from time to time to see how he's doing. I hope I'm not being rude, but why do you care? Just because I am a demon does not mean I am a heartless killing machine. Our societies function much the same way yours do. We find children to be especially precious to us, since there are not that many. I must ask, how do you feel about Naruto? Is it true that you can heal him, and that you actually want to? I don't mean this to sound the way I'm sure it does, but I must know that you aren't trying to use him in some manner that could allow you to weaken the seal and escape to destroy Kanoha again. Relax, old man. Even if I could get out of the seal, this boy cares for your village, and I could not bring myself to destroy his home, so long as he cares for it. As to the healing, if you get me a book on human anatomy, I will be able to greatly increase the rate of his healing. Keep in mind, though, if Naruto ever decides to hate Konoha, and I find a way out of this seal that won't kill us both, I will return to finish destroying it. No child should be treated the way he has been. I completely agree with you there. I wish I could help him more, but I am hamstringed by the council. Were I to do more than I do now, they could accuse me of favoritism towards the demon and undermine my power even further. As horrible as it sounds, the good of the village must come before the good of any one member, even one as special as Naruto. I am going to hold you to your words, old man. Keep Naruto safe and happy, and I will do what I can to keep him healthy. Should your village continue to shun him, though Kaiubi switched back to her fox form and bellowed out, not even Kami herself will be able to stop me from destroying your village. I cannot speak for the villagers, but I will do what I can. I really doubt that anything I do will make much difference at this point. I will hold you to that as well, now good, day dot the fox then turned around and stalked farther back into the darkness. See Jai Chan, I told you you'd like her. Uh, yeah, sure, let's go with that. Now then, I think it is time for me to get you a book, but first, how about some ramen? Naruto recovered swiftly once the fox had a reference as to how his body was supposed to be. By the end of the week he was fully healed and back to attending class at the academy. When his classmates asked where he had been for the last three weeks, he just told them that he fell and broke his arm and both legs, which was true, he just changed the story to falling down some stairs. Despite the Hokage asking him directly, Naruto never told him that he knew all of the names that were carved into him. He just spent the next four years pranking the hell out of those responsible. The pranks were never dangerous, just inconvenient. For some, he broke into their homes and rearranged all of their furniture. Others he let wild animals into. Some of them even changed the locks on. His crowning jewel, though, was what he did to the two who burned his apartment down. He dragged them into the middle of the village the night before a morning festival, stripped them down to nothing, and tied them to a sign, which was humiliating in and of itself, until one looked at the manner they were tied up in. One of them was bent over in front of the other, and their proximity to each other implied that they were in the middle of having fun together. When the Hokage got the report, he had to immediately excuse himself and spent the rest of the day laughing so hard in his office. Inu's Anbu team were all amazed that a student could do that to a pair of until they began to realize that all of the names on the scroll that Inu had given to the Hokage were among Naruto's prank victims. They were still amazed by Naruto's skills, but it made perfect sense to them as to why he did it. The thing that surprised them even more was that the only person who could catch him was his academy teacher, Hiroka. Well, Inu's team could have done it, as well as the, and a lot of the, but for some reason the Hokage only ever sent Nu after him. So, it should be no surprise that Aruka caught Naruto skipping class again and had him detained. Naruto, you can't keep skipping class like this. If you want to get your grades up, you need to actually be here to learn the information so you can pass your tests. But there's no point, Sensei the now 11-year-old Naruto argued, you're the only teacher who cares about me. The rest of them still try to make me fail. I mean, I don't get tests anymore, but they still mess with them. 
they change the words around and use really big ones that I don't know, and when I ask for help they usually ignore me. Last week Tao Sensei gave me a detention just because I raised my hand. He said that I was giving inappropriate gestures or something like I was flipping him off, and I wasn't this time, I promise. Naruka just sighed. Tao taught to Jutsu and hated Naruto with a passion. So, one day Naruto just gave him the finger and walked out of class, which landed him in a week-long detention. Well, I'll go talk to Hokage-sama later, see if we can't get you some better teachers. If I do that will you at least show up for my class? Yeah, I'll show up for your class, Naruka-sensei. Just don't make me sit next to Sasuke team. Naruto, you should try to be nice to him. I do, but he thinks that just because he's a Chiha that makes him perfect, and he's not. You know what, let's go see if we can talk to Hokage-sama right now Ruka said, not wanting to listen to Naruto rant on about why Sasuke was a team. The pair made their way to the tower, and just as Aruka was about to open the door, they both heard shouting from inside the office. What? I gotta do what? Damn that council. I'm gonna shove a kunai up there sideways. Aruka poked his head in the door, revealing an uncomfortable Siratobi and a massively pissed off Anko, who was the source of the yelling. Uh, is it a bad time Aruka asked. Not really, Iruka the Hokage replied, Anko's just mad that the council wants her to take a team this year. What do you need? Well, it's about Naruto here he said, dragging Naruto into the room with him. The rest of the teachers still keep trying to fail him on purpose. If Naruto stays there, there is almost no way he'll be able to pass. Tsuritobi just sighed. Then, a thought struck him. He flipped through the folders on his desk for the new genin applicants and realized that there would be one student without a team, and if he remembered correctly, the next year's class had the same problem. Anko, would you rather have a 2 team versus a 3 team? Of course. I hate new genins, the less the better. Well, only one would be a new genin. Sweet. Only one nonsense to teach. The other is still a student. Aruka and Anko both looked at the Hokage, huh? Naruto is not getting proper instruction from the academy due to the personal bias of most of his teachers. I want you to take over teaching the practical knowledge he has missed out on while Laruka will cover the academic portion. This will get you out of having to take a full team, but because the council wants you to do more than take an apprentice, you will have a two-man team. Or rather, one boy and one girl. Duty, I got a wannabe Kinoichi and the fox brat. Anko said, her voice dripping with sarcasm. Her name is Tenten. He was cut off from explaining further by an outburst from Naruto. I get to be on a team with Tenchan. Awesome. Anko looked at Naruto, you know her, Brad. Yeah, she's my friend. They stayed there for a little while longer to work out the details, and then Aruka and Naruto left to get Raymond. The first day of Naruto's break found him trudging out to the training grounds, trying to find his new sensei. He hadn't realized it, but they had never set a meeting point. So, he wandered the training fields looking for them, and eventually found them at training ground 44. Grumbling to himself, he walked up to them. Out time you showed up, Brad. Fenton spun around, having not been told who her other teammate was. Naruto. Hi Ten-chan. And I woulda been here a long time ago if you woulda told me where to go yesterday. I did too tell you, Brad. Yeah, be at the training grounds first thing in the morning is hardly a place to be. You do know that we have like a hundred training fields, right? How was I supposed to know which one you'd be at? Details, details. Anyway, this is where we will meet from now on. She was prevented from continuing by Tenten. Uh, Sensei, what is he doing here? Naruto hasn't graduated yet. Anko glared at Tenten, I was getting to that. For whatever reason, none of the teachers at the academy actually teach him anything, with the exception of Aruka, so the Hokage set it up that we would help him get up to where he is supposed to be so he can graduate next year. Why do they hate you so much, Naruto Tenten asked, immediately sending him into a panic attack. He knew, he just didn't want to tell her yet, since the fox was the reason she had no parents. He was saved from answering, though by Anko. It's a long story, he'll tell you some other time. We're late enough as it is. Naruto looked at her with an expression of silent thanks. Now, Naruto will be with Aruka in the morning, so that will be when we work she said to Tenten. The afternoons will be for helping the brat get caught up. They both mumbled a response. I can't hear you brats, speak up. Hi, sensei they both replied. Now then, I want you two to spar so that I can see what you need to work on. Start with just Jutsu first. Tenten just arched an eyebrow while Naruto looked apprehensive. It was no secret to any of them, Naruto's skills were horrible, with the exception of his hinge and his stealth. He could transform and hide with the best of them, but once he was found, the only advantages he had were near limitless stamina and chakra. He was a rather accomplished trap maker, but that didn't really help him in a fight. Still, Naruto and Tenten squared off, with her slipping into the academy stance, while Naruto slid into his extremely nonsense-sized version of it. Anko cringed just looking at it, it was so bad. The fight didn't go very well for him either. 
In addition to having almost no training, he was holding back since he didn't want to hurt Tintin. Naruto, stop holding back. She's not gonna break if you hit her. Naruto just grumbled more and stopped pulling his punches. It certainly helped, but he still got him kicked. After about the 10th straight loss for Naruto, Anko decided to move on. Alright, what ninjutsu do you know? Well, I just got the three Tintin replied, while well, Naruto just mumbled something that neither one could catch. What did you say, brat? I said I can do henge. I get Kawarimi sometimes, and I can't make a bunch and to save my life Naruto said while staring at the ground. Come here, brat, I might be able to tell you why you can't do a bunch and. I'm guessing your control is absolutely terrible Naruto nodded sadly. Well, it goes with having so much chakra dot she then pulled a sheet of paper out of one of her pockets. It was divided into six sections. This is a type of chakra paper. It gives a rough visual approximation of your chakra capacity. Naruto looked beyond confused while Tenten was following without any problems. Uh, you channel chakra into it and it tells you how much chakra you have. Oh, okay. Now, I will demonstrate she said and channeled her chakra into the paper, causing four of the six sections to turn black. This is how much chakra I have, which is pretty normal for it. Hokage-sama has a little over five, I think. She then gave the paper to Tenten, who managed to turn about half of one square black. A little low, but still decent she said to the girl, before handing it to Naruto. Does it matter how much I channel into it he asked. Nope. It reacts with the chakra somehow, and it just knows how much you have. I really don't know how it does that, so don't ask. Here goes Naruto called out, as he began to channel his massive reserves into the paper. The results were shocking, to say the least. The whole paper instantly turned jet black and began to smoke before bursting into flames. He quickly dropped it before looking up at Anko, uh, what does that mean? Uh, well, I guess it means that you have a lot of chakra. Here, try it again just in case she said, pulling out another sheet of the paper. Naruto channeled chakra into it again and got the same results. What they didn't know was that the paper was reacting with the fox's chakra, too, which was why it was overloading like that. Needless to say, Naruto's last year at the academy was rather interesting. He sat through all of Iruka's morning classes as an assistant and all of his afternoons getting beat up by Anko. He wanted to learn ninjutsu, but she wasn't allowed to teach him any beyond the academy ones until he graduated. Once he had a competent teacher, he soaked them up like a sponge, or at least as much as his limited chakra control would allow. He still couldn't make a good bunshin, but his kawarimi was much better, as were the rest of his academy skills. His control, while still bad, improved by leaps and bounds, and by the end of the year, could do tree climbing without conscious thought, and could almost do the water walking. The only thing he really had problems with, besides his control and bunshins, was when Anko tried to teach him Katen. Second in Habana, Ember Spark, the academy fire dot. When he saw it, his eyes went wide, and he backed far away from her, before falling over and breaking out in a cold sweat. Anko found the reaction very odd, since he wasn't afraid of any other fire technique she had used. Fortunately Tenten wasn't there at the moment, so there was no need to explain it to her. You okay, brat? Yeah, I just don't like that technique. Why not Anko asked, confused. That was the one I was lit on fire with when I was seven he murmured out in reply. Realization hit her like a brick wall. It was the first time he had seen the technique since that day, and he obviously hadn't completely gotten over it. Seeing it again had apparently triggered some repressed memories. Alright, we'll end here for the day. Go home and get some sleep. It will help the memory fade again. It may seem worse in the short run, but overall it's much better to deal with it sooner rather than later. Really? Yup. I've seen and done some really bad things in my life, and I still have nightmares every once in a while, but they're not near as bad as they used to be. Alright, Sensei Naruto said, as he began to head home. When he got there, he went straight to bed, even though it was barely past dinner time. It didn't take him long to fall asleep, but instead of nightmares, he landed in his mindscape. He wandered to where the fox was, to see what she wanted. But I want, Kaiyu-chan. I thought you trusted me, Naruto. The fox looked disappointed and a little sad as she said this, confusing Naruto. But I do, Kaiyu-chan. Then why won't you let me help you? Huh? You keep burying your emotions and bad memories, even though you have been told repeatedly not to. It's not healthy. You need to face them and come to terms with them. What if you had been on a mission and an enemy used the ember spark? You would be dead right now. I can help you, but only if you are willing to go all the way this time. You must bear yourself completely. I know that you fear that more than anything else in the world, but for me to help you, I must know it all. I know that you deliberately hid memories from me last time, but I chose not to say anything about it. Also, just so you know, I am capable of just looking at them by myself, without any input or consent from you, but I feel that would violate your privacy. Naruto looked at the fox with a defeated expression. He knew that this was something he had to do, but he really didn't want to have to relive all of his bad memories again. 
especially not that one, because this time he would get all of it. The last time he and Kaiu chan had gone over it, she had spared him the worst bits of it, but not this time. This time, he was coming completely clean with her, and she with him. Okay Naruto said, looking at the fox again, this time with a determined look, let's get this over with. Naruto walked through the bars of the cage and sat down back to back with the fox, while trying to emotionally prepare himself for what he was about to witness. You ready, Naruto? I guess. Let's just get it over with. Naruto then closed his eyes and took a deep breath, while Kaiubi began the memory viewing technique. The earliest ones he had were of him after the ceiling while he was in the hospital, and they continued through the rest of his life. Most were not pleasant, and none were anything close to a normal childhood. It ended up taking them several hours to get through the unedited and raw memories of that night, but the rest of them went by without much incident. Well, until they finished, anyway. As soon as the fox had released a memory viewing technique, Naruto spun around and hugged her as hard as he could, locking her in a death grip hug. A short while later, his grip relaxed enough for her to turn to face him. Then she draped her arms around him, returning the hug. Before long, he was asleep in her arms. Once Naruto fell asleep, his dreams were mercifully free of nightmares, and when he awoke, finding that it was almost 10 the next day, he found himself unable to remove a particular dream from his head. The dream was his life without ever having had the fox attack Konoha. He knew that because he had no whisker marks on his face, nobody called him names as he was led through the village, and he seemed to have a caretaker of some sort. He seemed to be around 4 or 5 in this dream, and the woman who was leading him around was very pretty. She was almost 5 and half feet tall, and had waist-length reddish-orange hair. Her eyes were a slightly pale green, although they were full of life. She was wearing a tan kimono, and since he was dressed up as well, he assumed that they were on their way to some kind of festival. He had gotten tired of walking at one point, so the woman had picked him up and kissed him on the cheek, a huge smile on her face. The sensations brought about by the dream kiss were so strong they were actually what woke him up. Huh, like that would ever happen to me. I wonder what Jai-chan would think about it. Naruto rarely remembered his dreams, and whenever he did, he always went and told the old man about them. When he got there, though, the guard wouldn't let him into the tower. I highly doubt that the Hokage wants to see a demon like you the Anbu spat out, while casually resting his hand on the hilt of his sword. Now go away before you annoy me. Naruto's reaction surprised the Anbu. He started laughing. This made the Anbu very angry, but he noticed that the Hokage was right behind him before he could do anything about it. Yagi, goat, did you say that the demon was trying to see me the old man asked. Hi Hokage-sama. That's what I thought you said. Well, you're fired. Please report to the academy tomorrow morning for enlistment if you wish to continue to be employed as a shinobi of this village. If you have a problem with that, please take it up with Ibiki Siratobi said while glaring at the now ex -Anbu. The man just stood there in shock, unable to believe that he had just been fired. The old man then turned to Naruto, well, come on, Naruto. I just got out of a council meeting and need to relax. Naruto just followed the old man into the tower, thinking that the council meeting must have been really bad if the old man was just up and firing people who made him mad. As soon as Saratobi sat down behind his desk, he immediately gathered up all the papers on it and stuffed them into a drawer, declaring that he would do it later. So, what brings you here today? Naruto then went on to tell him about what happened the previous day with Anko and about the memory thing with Kaiubi. He then went on to describe his dream to him. I'm sorry, Naruto, I just can't get a good mental image of what this woman looked like. Naruto had been trying to explain it for almost half an hour. Mm, ah, I know, Henj Naruto yelled out, transforming himself into the woman from his dream. This is what she looked like, Jai Chan. Saratobi just stared at the woman, his jaw hanging somewhere near the floor in the basement of the tower. He shook himself out of his stupor before Naruto noticed and slowly asked, Naruto, did you ever hear what her name was? No, but everyone was really nice to her, why? Do you know her Naruto asked, releasing the hinge. Hi, but before I tell you who it is, I want you to sit down. Naruto said. I want to tell you her name, but I am afraid I can't do that. Before you ask, she had a lot of enemies, and if they knew about you, they might try to hurt you, and I don't want that. What do her enemies want with me? I've never seen her before Naruto shouted out. You have, actually, you just don't remember it. That woman is your mother, Naruto. Huh? That's my mother? Why do you think that Naruto asked, clearly not believing him, but at the same time hoping desperately that it was true. He had never told anyone, but he had always secretly feared that his parents had just abandoned him because they didn't want him. I was there when you were born, Naruto. Naruto just sat in shock, before bursting out in tears. What's wrong with Naruto Sirotobi asked, as he got up from his desk. If I got a mom, why am I an orphan? She hates me, doesn't she? He sobbed out, his worst fear having been just confirmed. His mother hadn't wanted him and had thrown him out in the street. Realization suddenly dawned on the old man, and he threw himself towards the boy at near Horatian speed, wrapping him up in a hug. 
shh, Naruto, that's not what I meant. When she held you right after you were born, I could tell that she loved you more than anything else in this world. The reason she isn't here now is because dot dot well, it's because she's not with us anymore. She gave birth during the Kaiubi attack, and all the demonic chakra in the air, combined with some complications during the birthing itself, were just too much for her body to handle. I'm sorry, Naruto, I really am. I was going to tell you when you made Genin, but I guess you beat me to it. Naruto just sobbed into the Hokage's shoulder for a while, until a thought was finally able to form in his head. W what about my daddy asked slowly, like he was almost afraid of the answer. I know who your father is, but I can't tell you who he is yet, either. There are even more people who wanted him dead than wanted your mother dead, to the point that they would consider sending an army here just to kill his son. I can tell you though that he loved you very much, and it pained him more than anything to leave you and your mother to fight off the fox. I am sure that they are beyond proud of you, just like I am Saratobi told the boy, tears of his own rolling silently down his wrinkled cheeks. The next day finds Naruto waiting to take the graduation test for the academy. Fortunately, the class was leaving him alone. Well, they actually hadn't realized that he was in the room yet, since he hadn't said anything yet to draw attention to himself. He was too busy thinking about what he had learned the previous day. The fact that both of his parents were dead didn't bother him as much as he thought it would, and he was very glad that they hadn't abandoned him. His biggest secret fear had been laid to rest, his parents loved him. He was so lost in thought he almost missed his name being called to go take the test. He walked down to the front of the class, ignoring all the taunts that he would fail. When he got into the room that he was to be tested in, Haruka sat down, and Mizuki said, Alright, Naruto, you just need to spar with me for a little bit, and then do a henge, a kawarimi, and make three clones, okay. Hi, Sensei Naruto replied, and began to spar with Mizuki. The Chunin was surprised at how much Naruto had grown, but didn't really care about him. Naruto was the demon, after all. Okay, good. That's all for the sparring part. Now Henge is into Aruka sensei Naruto did as asked, transforming into a perfect copy of his teacher. Kawarimi Aruka asked, and Naruto swapped places with a chair in the corner of the room before swapping back. But Naruto asked. Yeah, Naruto, that was good Aruka replied, before taking a deep breath. He knew that Naruto still couldn't make three clones to save his life. Last time he checked, Naruto could make about one and a half. Now you just have to make three clones, and you'll pass. I can do this Naruto thought, as he began to mold his chakra. When he felt it was right, he called out, Bunshin no Jutsu filling the room with smoke. Haruka held his breath, while Mizuki tried not to laugh at Naruto as the smoke cleared. Standing before the two Chunin was two and a half Naruto's. The original, one good clone, and one clone that looked like it had some terminal disease that was seconds away from killing it. Haruka just sighed heavily, dreading what he was about to say. Naruto locked eyes with Haruka, already knowing that he failed again. Naruto Haruka began. His voice was heavy with sadness and regret. I know, Haruka-sensei. I failed again. Well come on now, Haruka, he obviously tried as best he could, and has made major improvements this year Mizuki broke in. Can't you cut him some slack? I mean, I heard that some kid passed away last year, and he can't use chakra at all. Haruka just sighed again, I wish there was something I could do, I really do. Unfortunately the council has edited the graduation requirements, and there is no give in the new rules. If we pass him and they find out that he can't make three clones, we can lose our jobs, not just as teachers, but as shinobi altogether. Haruka said sadly. It's okay, Haruka sensei. I'll just make sure that I can make three bunshin before next year Naruto said quietly, before jumping out of the window, so he wouldn't have to face his classmates without a forehead protector on. Later that night, Mizuki found Naruto sitting on top of the fort's head, staring blankly out at the village. You know, Naruto, Haruka didn't fail you because he hates you. I know, Mizuki-sensei. I just really thought I would get it this time. Mizuki waited for a few seconds before continuing, you know, Naruto, there is a dot dot alternative way to graduate from the academy. Naruto's eyes lit up as he spun around to face his teacher, really. Uh huh, I would not have said something about it earlier, but it hasn't been used for a really long time, and I kinda forgot about it Mizuki said, laughing slightly. All you have to do is sneak into the Hokage Tower, find the hidden scroll room, and take the biggest one in there. Once you do that, you have to learn one of them, and then show it to me or Aruka. Now, normally I'm not supposed to help you with this, but if I was to say, drop a piece of paper with the location of the scroll room on it, as well as a good place to practice the jutsus on the scroll, I wouldn't be helping you, now would I? Nah sensei, you'd be littering Naruto said with a grin, as Mizuki wadded up a piece of paper from his pocket and dropped it on the ground. He then smiled at Naruto, before saying, I hope to see you at the team placement tomorrow, Naruto then he poofed away in a cloud of smoke. 
Naruto reached over and picked up the discarded paper. So, all I have to do is learn one dot. Iruka Mizuki screamed as he barged into his fellow teacher's apartment, Naruto has stolen the forbidden scroll. What Iruka screamed back as he jumped up from his table, the papers he had been grading flying all over the room. Why would he do that? I don't know, but Hokage-sama has ordered us all to go out and find him. Iruka quickly grabbed his gear, alright, let's go he said to Mizuki, before dashing off to Naruto's closest known hiding spot. An hour after Iruka started looking for him, and three hours after he had stolen the scroll, Naruto sat in a small clearing in the woods, leaning up against an old cabin. He was very dirty, and very tired. He had been practicing non-stop the whole time he had been in the clearing, and he had just finished the first he had looked at. Just as he was about to look for a second to learn, a very pissed off Iruka landed on the other side of the clearing. Naruto he growled out, but before he could continue, Naruto interrupted him. Oh, hi Ruka sensei you're just in time, I just got done learning from the scroll. Huh? I just gotta show you that I can do one off the scroll, and then I graduate. Naruto, who told you that? Izuki sensei did. He told me that if I snuck into the tower and got the scroll, all I had to do was to show you one off of it, and then you would pass me. He even told me about this place to practice. He did what? Suddenly, several kunai started flying out of the trees, and acting on instinct, Iruka shoved Naruto out of their path, taking the hits himself, leaving him pinned to the wall of the cabin. Bam, I missed the brat. Oh, well. Naruto, I need you to give me that scroll. Iruka-sensei, are you okay? I'll be fine. Just don't give him that scroll. He's using you to steal it for him. The FFT, as if I would need a failure of a student to do that for me, even if he is a demon, I'm still better than him. Shut up Mizuki. It's forbidden to talk about that. The talk about what, that Naruto is the Kaiubi, the same Kaiubi that killed your parents. Yes. Oh. Oops. It's okay, Iruka sensei I already know about Kaiubi. Mizuki and Iruka both looked at him, huh? I already know that I hold the Kaiubi. You can't scare me with it Naruto said, surprising the two chunins. Mizuki recovered first, well, I guess it doesn't really matter that you know that you're a demon daddy, then removed one of the shuriken from his back and began to spin it. You're still going to die here he then hurled the massive shuriken at Naruto. Now, Naruto was known for not being afraid of much in the ninja world, a fact that he was secretly very proud of. He was not afraid of being injured, he was not afraid of Anko, he was not afraid of the Hokage, and he wasn't afraid of the Anbu. He wasn't afraid of Kaiubi. The few times he had been allowed to hold weapons at the academy, he wasn't afraid of those, although that might have been due to the fact that he wouldn't have been able to cut hot Raymond with them. He wasn't afraid of them the one time he held sharp ones either. However, the sight of a shuriken big enough to cut him in half flying at his face was enough to make him afraid. This was, after all, the first time someone had thrown a shuriken at him. He was so afraid that he wasn't able to move out of its path. Realizing he was about to die, he closed his eyes and waited for it to split him at the waist. A second later, his ears told him that the shuriken had impacted flesh. That's weird he thought, I figured being cut in half would hurt a lot more than this he then cracked his eyes open, only to see Aruka crouched over him, with the shuriken sticking out of his back. It's Dot and Gok, Naruto, I don't ah uh, hold it against you. After all, it's impossible to kill that many people when you're only a few hours old. Izuki just stared at them from his perch on a tree branch, and then started laughing at them. I can't believe you, Aruka. You just protected the thing that killed your parents. I suppose I did, didn't I? However, as much as I would love to see the fox dead in a ditch somewhere, I would rather have Naruto alive than the fox, dead Aruka said as he stood up, yanking the giant shuriken from his back. Do bad I'm going to kill you both then, isn't it Mizuki then unleashed his second shuriken, which Aruka blocked by throwing the one that had been in his back. They impacted each other and flew off into the woods, slicing through several tree branches. Mizuki then charged Aruka, pulling out a kunai. Aruka countered with his own, but due to his injuries, it didn't take long for Mizuki to overpower him. Before he could finish off the other, though, Naruto shook himself out of his shock-induced stupor and landed a knee to Mizuki's face. When Mizuki looked at Naruto, he found the young student leveling a death glare at him and then heard him say, if you touch Iruka-sensei again, I'll kill you. As if you couldn't kill a dying rat, let alone a chunin like me Mizuki shouted. By the end of his statement, Mizuki was charging Naruto, another kunai ready to be plunged into the blonde's chest. On a bet Naruto growled out, crossing his fingers into a seal. Cage Bunshin no Jutsu. Mizuki was forced to stop charging from all the smoke, and when it cleared, it revealed over 200 Naruto's, all of whom immediately started taunting Mizuki. Oh, big deal, you made a bunch of clones, not like they can actually do anything. That's wrong, Mizuki Aruka interrupted, cage bunshin are different from regular bunshin, in that it makes solid bodies, capable of dealing actual damage. This news made Mizuki pale, and all the clones picked that moment to charge. When the dust settled, Mizuki was very much unconscious. 
a Hehinaruto laughed nervously, his right hand scratching the back of his head, guess I was too much for him. Iruka just chuckled briefly and slumped down further against the tree he was leaning against before standing up fully. Naruto, can you come over here? There is something that I want to give to you. Meanwhile, the Hokage was calling off the search for Naruto. It's alright now, Naruto has been found and will be back here shortly. Sensei, can I open my eyes yet Naruto asked impatiently. Alright, go ahead Aruka replied. Naruto opened his eyes, revealing a slightly different looking Aruka, who had his goggles in his hand. Ashi Osutsusha, Naruto. Slowly, the implications of Aruka's words made their way into Naruto's head. Congratulations on graduating. Why would he say that? It would have to mean I graduated. Naruto looked back up at Aruka and noticed that he wasn't wearing his forehead protector anymore. Well, that explains why he looks different. Wait, he has no forehead protector and he's holding my goggles in his hands. What am I feeling on my forehead then? Naruto slowly reached his right hand up and ran it across his forehead, his fingers brushing against a warm engraved metal plate. As he began to realize what Aruka had done, tears began to form in his eyes. His fingers traced the Kanoha leaf engraved on the plate, as well as all the scratches and scuff marks on it. Arigato, Iruka sensei Naruto finally managed to choke out, tears streaming down his face. Well, come on, let's go get some ramen, my treat. Iruka replied, smiling brightly. Naruto then grabbed Iruka into a bone-crunching hug, knocking him back into a tree, and while Iruka was screaming out in pain, inside he couldn't be happier. Two days later, Naruto is walking through the academy for the last time as a student. He walks slowly, savoring the few good memories he has of the place. As he approached Aruka's room, he steeled himself for the barrage of questions he knew he would get as soon as he walked in. He had, after all, not returned to the classroom after taking his genin test. When he reached the door, he took a deep breath and slid it open. Stepping inside the room, it immediately fell silent until Kiba yelled out, Hey, what are you doing in here? You're not supposed to be here unless you passed, and you didn't. Naruto just sighed. You must be blind, mutt face, because I have a forehead protector Naruto said, while jerking his thumb to his covered forehead. I have just as much right to be here as you do Dottie then walked over to a seat and flopped down between Shikamaru and Shino, figuring that it would be quieter there. Greetings were exchanged between the three, meaning Shikamaru lifted his head just enough to see that it was Naruto before falling back asleep, and Shino just tipped his head forward just enough for Naruto to detect the movement. Greetings being finished, Naruto spent the rest of the time until Aruka showed up glaring at Sasuke. When Aruka walked in a few minutes later, Naruto could barely tell that his teacher had had a giant shuriken sticking out of his back two days ago. His limp was almost gone too. Alright, everybody, quiet down Aruka began, which everyone ignored. He waited for a few minutes, as his eyebrow twitch got worse, and when a vein began to bulge on his forehead, Naruto quietly put his hands over his ears. As soon as he had, Iruka let loose his patented big head no jutsu and yelled, sit down and shut up. This managed to get the attention of the class, and they sat down, only for Sakura to yell out, Sensei, why is Naruto Baka here? He didn't pass his test. Sakura, look at Naruto and tell me what is on his head. Sakura turned to look at Naruto, and sure enough, she saw his forehead protector. But he didn't come back afterwards like he was supposed to she yelled next. So what, I was hungry and went to get some food Naruto grumbled out, just cause I didn't come back doesn't mean I failed. Sakura opened her mouth to continue the argument, but Aruka cut her off, well, since everyone is here, I'll announce the team's daddy, then proceeded to list off teams 1 through 6, each time making the girls who were picked upset because they weren't on a team with Sasuke come. Team 7 is Sai, Ichiha Sasuke, and Haruno Sakura. Ha! Take that, Ino Pig Sakura shouted out, while Ino just glared back at her. The ham, your instructor is Hada Kakashi. Teammate is Aburam Shino, Hayuga Hinata, and Inuzuka Kiba. Your instructor is Yuhi Kuranai. Team 9 is still in use, so next is Team 10, which is Akamichi Chaoji, Nara Shikamaru, and Yamanaka Ino, led by Siratobi Asuma. Ino was mortified. Her rival was on a team with her Sasuke Kun, and she was stuck with the embodiments of being fat and lazy. What about Naruto Sakura asked. What team is he on? He's probably not on one because he failed Kiba replied. Naruka glared at both of them, shutting them up, before turning to Naruto with a pleasant smile on his face, Naruto, feel free to rejoin your team at any time. Uh several people said. Ugh, Naruto has been on a team for the last year already. If you have any questions about it, ask him. Every head in the class turned to look at Naruto, who pointed at the door, ask her. Standing in the doorway was a woman, five and a half feet tall, wearing a brown miniskirt, a tan trench coat, and a mesh shirt that covered basically nothing. She had purplish hair done up in a style similar to Shikamaru's, and brown eyes. Kiba started drooling as soon as he saw her, Sasu glared at her, and Choji dropped his chips. Shikamaru kept sleeping, and nobody could tell if Shino had a reaction. 
The girls were all in shock that she walked around dressed like that. Baruka even had to turn away for a moment to let the color drain out of his cheeks, and once he had control of himself, he turned back to Anko, the class wants to know a little bit about you, Anko. Would you care to enlighten them? Eh? I'm just here to pick up the brat. Come on, sensei, mess with their heads a little Naruto said, smirking slightly. Fine, brat, you win. It was at that point that she noticed Kiba drooling and decided to fix the problem. Sensei Jashu she shouted out, directing her arm at the drooling and Yuzuka. Several snakes shot out of her sleeve, wrapping him up and hoisting him into the air. She then retracted the snakes, bringing the still-bound Kiba closer to her. Look here, I greatly dislike perverts, and if you don't stop looking at me like that, you'll find a certain part of you no longer attached. She then pressed a kunai against a part of him she would remove with her other hand, while a few of the snakes hissed right next to Kiba's ear. Understand. Oh, and I won't just do it to you. Your dog will get it too. Akamaru just cowered and whined from on top of Kiba's head, and Kiba shakily replied, Hi. The class turned back to look at Naruto to judge his reaction, and he said, What? You should see her when she's angry. Never, ever, mess with her dango. I got you good for that. Learned your lesson though, didn't you Brad? You didn't really have to go that far. What happened? She stripped me of my underwear and let about 40 snakes have their way with me while I was tied to a tree. Ah, that was like punishment. Anyway, it's time to go, Brad. We've wasted enough time here already. The two then left the room, leaving the class speechless. When they arrived at the training area outside the forest of death, Tenton was waiting for them. What took you guys so long? Kiba was eyeing sensei like a side of beef. Oh, never mind then. Shut up brats. Now that blondie here has passed, we can do some better stuff than we have been. First thing, though, I want you two to spar again, since it's been like a month or something since the last time. Earls Tenton asked. No fatal blows, try not to make any others too deep, other than that, anything goes. Naruto looked at Tenton, all out from the start. Tenton arched an eyebrow, you really want to be a pincushion that bad. Haha, ha, I learned something new a few days ago, and I want to try it out. They each dropped into academy stances, and Anko signaled them to begin. Tenton immediately went into a defensive stance, waiting for Naruto's inevitable bull rush. This time though, it never came. Instead, Naruto crossed his fingers into a seal and announced the name of his technique, Cage Bunch and No Jutsu. The clearing was blanketed in smoke, and when it cleared, there were 15 Naruto's facing Tenton. So you figured out how to make clones, big deal, they can't really do anything. Benko was in shock. She hadn't read the report from the Mizuki incident yet and had no idea that he could make shadow clones. Meanwhile, the Naruto's were continuing their conversation with Tenton. Really, you want to stand by that statement? Of course I'm going to. Clones aren't real, they're just illusions. Everybody knows that, Baka. Alright, I dare you to stand there while my clones throw kunai at you. Eel, and when they pass through me harmlessly, you have to buy me lunch. Dango, all you can eat. Naruto just smirked, alright, but when they hit you, you gotta stay that way for the rest of the day, and I promise that I won't be perverted anywhere. She thought about it for a minute before agreeing to it. The clones took careful aim and each threw a kunai at her simultaneously, leaving no room for doubt. 13 of the 15 kunai bounced off various parts of her body, and the last two skimmed through her hair. There was a loud poofing noise, and Tenton asked, Alright, I admit that they're real clones, but why do I have to stay this way? You didn't do anything to me. The voice then spoke behind her, wrong, Tenchan. The voice, which was another Naruto clone, yanked off her headband, revealing what the two kunai that skimmed her hair had done. They had cut through the ties holding her buns in place, and when the clone removed the headband, her hair was free to hang loose. Hey! Give that back she screamed at the clone, who immediately tossed the headband back to her. Headband in hand, she turned back to the original, so why did you do that? You know I hate having my hair down. It gets in the way too much. Haha, <laughs> that's why I did it Naruto replied, smirking slightly. It quickly went away though, when he noticed a gleam forming in her eyes, a gleam that promised pain at the hands of her and her beloved arsenal of pointy things. Boy, whiskers, I suggest you run now Anko said, still pondering about Naruto's clones. Naruto just created about 30 more clones and took off, tenting clothes on his heels. Anko meanwhile was trying to scrape her jaw off the ground at the amount of clones he could make. It's like the brat is a one-man army. Not even Hokage-sama can make that many cage bunchens without feeling it, and he does it like it's nothing. Naruto and his few remaining clones were now running around the forest of death at top speed, trying to avoid Tenten and her beloved points. He was also learning that his clones were far less durable than he was. One hit to a clone and poof. It's gone, just like that. He had initially tried deflecting her weapons with his own, until he remembered that she carried far, far more than he did. After that realization, he just ran. Naruto was about to start his tenth lap around the forest when Anko snagged him right out of the air, along with Tenten a moment later. 
Brat, where did you learn to make cage bunch and Naruto just looked at her and raised an eyebrow, slightly tilting his head toward Tenten, silently asking how much she knew. Anko slightly shook her head no, telling him that Tenten knew nothing. Mizuki team convinced me to steal the forbidden scroll. I did and learned cage bunchin from that. Tenten's jaw hit the ground. There's no way a genin stole the forbidden scroll. It's like locked up in the Hokage Tower. Anko looked at her, you're right, a genin didn't steal it. An academy student did. The scroll wasn't just hidden in the tower, either. It was in Hokage Sama's office. Tenten just looked at Naruto, her jaw still on the floor. Since I can tell you want to know how I did it, I'll tell you. Mizuki team gave me a paper that had the location of the scroll on it, as well as where all the guards were. When you know where they all are, it makes getting past them really easy. Anyway, when I got to Jai Chan's office, I knocked him out and took the scroll to a clearing out in the woods where I practiced cage bunshin. Right after I got it down, Aruka sensei and Mizuki showed up, which is when I learned that Mizuki was a traitor. He and Aruka sensei fought, and Aruka sensei got beat up kinda bad. After that, I finished Mizuki team off with Cage Bunshin. Hey brat, how'd you knock out Hokage-sama? Both of you promise you won't hit me or anything and I'll show you. Huh? Dai-chan is a pervert, and I used my anti-pervert on him. I used it on Aruka sensei in class once too, and Sakura and Ino and some other girl hit me so hard I went through the wall. Alright, brat, I promise not to hit you. Buns. Benton just glared at Anko for being called Buns, but said, Hi, I promise too. I wanna know how to take out a cage. Alright, but I don't know if it would work against the other ones, it's just for perverts. Oriak no Jutsu Naruto shouted out, transforming into a slightly older female version of himself, with wisps of smoke just barely covering the essentials. He then walked over to Anko, unconsciously swaying his hips until he was close enough to hang off of her. He leaned in close to her and whispered, come on, Anko-sama, let's go have some fun. His transformation had a strange effect on the girls. Tenten looked like she had been carved from stone due to the shock of seeing female Naruto, and Anko turned rather red in the face. This only increased as Naruto walked closer to her, and when he spoke into her ear, the combination of his warm breath on her ear and neck, and the fact that he was looking like a girl, was too much for the woman to handle, and she keeled over backwards unconscious. Seeing Anko fall over broke Tenten out of her stupor at the same time Naruto released her, and he bent over Anko, as Tenten walked up next to him. Huh, that's the first time a girl passed out from that. Wait, she's got a nosebleed too. Anko-sensei is a pervert. This brought Anko back into consciousness, and she promptly whacked Naruto on the head while she wiped the blood away from her nose. Don't do that. Do what? Change into women, Baka Tenten continued, it's demeaning. Huh? Well, that's not what I was going to say, but I guess it works, what she means Brad is that it makes women look bad. Oh. Sorry, but it worked on you sensei. That means you're a pervert. This accusation actually made Anko sweat a little. She really did not want to explain to them that she liked both men and women, and that her ears and neck were very sensitive to being breathed on like that. I am not a pervert, and if you do that to me again, I will cut off certain parts of you and feed them to my snakes. Understand she finished, glaring at Naruto, while inwardly wishing he would do it again. Now then, I told each of you last month that I was going to try to train you in weapons and to pick some that you wanted to try. I want to know what you came up with Anko said, changing the topic. Oh, I want to learn katana and ninchaku Tenten said happily, since it involved her and learning about pointy things. Naruto, well, don't laugh, okay. Anyway, I was reading this old book, and some of the weapons in it sounded fun. What were they? Well, there was a twin kadachi, staff, and bow. What's a bow Tenten asked? Well, it looks like this dot Naruto was a clone, and it changed into a bow. What does it do? Naruto stoned another clone, turning that one into an arrow. It does this dot he picked up the arrow, fit it to the bow, and drew it back to his face. He then pointed it at a tree, and released the arrow. The bow twanged and the arrow buried itself in the tree trunk. So why do you want to learn that? I can do the same thing with a kunai. Tenten, how far can you accurately hit a target with enough force to kill? Well, if I use chakra in my throw, about a hundred feet. Why? I don't know how true this is because I can't do it yet, but the people in my book could put an arrow through the plate steel armor their enemies were wearing at double that distance, and if they had no armor they could kill it three times that distance, and all they used was their muscles. Just imagine that with chakra added. Wow. Well, Brad, I know people who can help with the staff and knives, but you're on your own for the bow, same for you buns. I know people who can do katana and nunchaku, but if you got anything fancy like whiskers here you're on your own. Poison, though, I can do it. Dot at the mention of poison Anko got a weird gleam in her eye, and it scared the two genin. Oh, before I forget, I'm supposed to give you some kind of test on your teamwork or something like that. If you fail, you go back to the academy. What? I just got out of there. I know, rat. I think this test is major bullshit, so we're gonna skip it. 
Instead, I want you two to go screw with Kakashi's team a little bit. Not enough to screw up their test, but enough to make it interesting, do it without getting caught, and I'll consider that a passing grade. But shouldn't they be done by now? You two got here like three hours ago Tenten said. HMPF, knowing Kakashi he's just about to show up. Unless it's a life-threatening situation, he's always at least two hours late, for everything. Meanwhile, the cogs in Naruto's head were turning full speed, until they landed on a box that was currently stashed under his bed. Sensei, what training ground does he use? Uh, number 7, I think. Awesome, we can stop by my apartment real quick on the way there. A similar gleam could be found in Naruto's eyes to Anko's at the mention of poison. We need to go there so I can get my prank supplies. Naruto's face erupted into a devious smile, and coupled with a gleam in his eyes, it made for a rather intimidating look. Naruto quickly led Tenten to his apartment. It's kinda messy at the moment. Mine is too, so don't worry about it. Alright, it'll only take me a few minutes to grab what I need, so don't touch anything. Why not, afraid I'll break something. No, I don't feel like resetting all of my traps right now. Oh, fine, I won't touch anything then. When they reached the apartment, Tenten was slightly put off by how run down the building looked. The paint was peeling, the railings barely looked strong enough to hold up some dust, and judging by how the roof sagged, it probably leaked. Naruto led her to his apartment and let her in. When she saw his apartment, she was surprised how different it looked to the outside of the building. The walls were in good shape, as was the floor and ceiling. The little furniture he had looked old but comfortable. The only thing wrong with it seemed to be the fact that it was covered in cup Raymond containers, and she was pretty sure she saw a pair of underwear in the corner. As soon as Naruto entered the apartment, he disappeared to his bedroom, grabbing out his box of prank supplies, as well as his own custom-made stealth suit. Since he wasn't allowed in the shop that sold them, he scavenged all the black fabric he could and made his own from the scraps. It didn't provide the same amount of protection that a normal stealth suit did, but he was able to put hidden pockets all over it. He slid into the stealth suit after discarding his jumpsuit, and after making sure all of his equipment was in place, he walked out of his room. Fenton was mildly surprised at how Naruto looked in black. When she noticed that what he was wearing was made out of random cloth scraps that were haphazardly stitched together, she arched her eyebrow. Hey, I made it myself. I can see that. Why didn't you just buy one? Naruto's happy expression fell off, and he looked at the floor. I'm not allowed in that store, so I can't buy one he said quietly. Huh? Why not? Tenten asked, concerned over his change of emotion. I dot it's a long story, I'll tell you some other time he replied, smiling again. Now let's go get Kakashi's team. Hiding in the trees, Naruto and Tenten watched as Team 7 waited for Kakashi to arrive, as he still hadn't shown up yet. The pair had started at training ground 7 and backtracked to the academy, which is where they found the three they were currently stalking. Kakashi finally showed up about 10 minutes after Naruto and Tenten started hiding outside the academy, and they watched as they moved to the roof and did their introductions. They weren't close enough to hear them, but it seemed that Sakura didn't like Sai all that much, since she kept glaring at him. Whenever Sakura looked at Sasuke, she got all googly-eyed. Sai and Kakashi looked indifferent to everything, and Sasuke just glared at everything, especially Sakura. Naruto and Tenten followed them to training ground 7 shortly thereafter, and this time crept close enough to hear what Kakashi was saying. Dot dot have three hours to get these bells from me. If you want to have any chance at all, I suggest that you come at me with the intent to kill. Naruto and Tenten watched as Team 7 glanced at each other uneasily. Then they heard Kakashi yell out start and poof away in a cloud of smoke. He reappeared right behind Naruto and Tenten, almost making them scream out in shock. Ma, you two are here, why? Uh, we're completing our genin test. Again, you two are here, why? Tenten spoke this time, our test involves messing with your test, which seems really stupid by the way. Are you trying to turn them against each other? Tenten had grasped the concept of Kakashi's test, they had to work together to take him down. Actually, yes I am. The bells create infighting among the team members, well the goal of the test is to get them to work together. Sounds kinda backwards to me Tenten replied. Kakashi shrugged, it's the same test my sensei gave me. Anyway, what exactly are you planning on doing here? I don't want you two interfering too much with my test. Naruto just patted the bag slung over his shoulder, I just got the usual stuff. I only brought the weak explosives, though. Ma, try and keep it under control Kakashi said as he began to walk away. Will do, Inusan Naruto said. This name made Kakashi stop in his tracks. As far as he knew, the only people who knew of his Anbu identity were his Anbu teammates and the Hokage. Why do you call me that Kakashi asked, turning back to face Naruto. Because that's who you are. You smell the same, like dogs and straw. Well, don't tell anybody, since you're not supposed to know that. Like anyone would believe me, the only people I talk to are Ten-chan, Anko-sensei, Jai-chan, and the Ichirakus. Still, try not to kill them, alright. 
Ayn, come on, Naruto, let's get them. The gleam returned to Naruto's eyes, and as Kakashi left them, the two began to plan their attack on the other three genins. As Kakashi walked away, Naruto caught a glimpse of him pulling something orange out of his equipment pouch. Boy, Ten-chan, I got an idea. Already? Yeah. Kakashi reads the same porn books that Jai-chan does. Instead of messing with his test, let's mess with him. But how? He's a, it's not like he'll fall for easy stuff. I know, we gotta get him off balance. Here's my plan. According to Jai-chan, Kakashi reads those books out in public and only reacts when people threaten his books, so, it was about 20 minutes after Kakashi had left Naruto and Tenten when he found the first one. The second was about 10 feet from the first. The third was 10 feet beyond that. He couldn't believe it. Someone had systematically discarded the first several Icha Icha editions, leaving them carelessly on the ground in the woods. He quickly gathered them up, never noticing the small poofs whenever he dropped one into his equipment pouch. After a short trip picking up the discarded books, Kakashi had a heart attack. There, in the middle of a clearing, was a bust young blonde girl, in a very, very tiny and tight bikini, standing next to the entire box set of every Icha Icha book, ever. Even the limited editions were there. Kakashi's visible eye lit up, and he charged the clearing, startling the girl just enough for it to be considered cute, and dove headlong into the pile of porn. He grabbed the book nearest his hand, flipped it open, and began giggling like a schoolgirl on crack, while the front of his mask began to turn red. Over in the bushes, Tenten couldn't believe that Naruto's plan was actually working. Nor could she believe that Kakashi was such a pervert. She waited until Kakashi was in position, and then signaled Naruto to begin the second stage of the plan. Ah no, Kakashi-sama the blonde asked, causing him to viciously rip his head out of the book he was reading. I seem to have come undone, would you be willing to tie me back up she asked, slowly spinning around to show that the bottom tie of her bikini top had indeed come undone. Reading porn was one thing, having it live and in front of him was another. I Kakashi said as he got up and slowly walked over to the young girl. Right before he could grasp the ties, though, a small dart hit him in the back of the neck. Ha he eloquently stated as he yanked it out. He then noticed that his vision was going blurry, and right before he passed out he saw the blonde girl disappear in a puff of smoke, along with all of the porn books. Wow, Ten-chan, you got him good Naruto said, as he poked Kakashi in the face with a stick. What, you doubted me? No. I just didn't think that my plan would work that well against him. I mean, he's supposed to be a dot. Yeah. Oh, hey, didn't he say something about them having to get bells? Yeah, why Naruto replied. Denton pointed to the two bells attached to the unconscious Jounin's belt. I say we take those and go mess with the rest of them. Now, it is important to note that Tenten has never pranked anybody before in her life. Much to her surprise, she found it to be quite enjoyable and was already thinking of other people she could do this to. But how Naruto asked. He was currently racking his brain, trying to figure out a way to prank the rest of Kakashi's team with just two bells. Well, you said that Sasuke is an arrogant jerk, right? Wouldn't it make him really mad if we showed up with the bells, dragging Kakashi behind us all tied up? This got the gears in Naruto's head going full speed. Oh. I got another idea. The genin of Team 7 had met up and were currently arguing about what plan to use. Sakura had figured out that they were supposed to team up against Kakashi, but Sasuke was being an idiot like usual and insisting on doing it alone. Sai, on the other hand, just kept insulting both of them, calling Sakura ugly and calling Sasuke duck in reference to his hair. This of course made Sasuke angrier, which made him want to work alone even more. Imagine their surprise then, when the so-called dead last of their academy class, along with several clones of himself, walk into their clearing, dragging the tied up and unconscious body of their teacher. Naruto Baka. What the hell are you doing here? What's it look like, Sakura-chan? I brought you your sensei back. It was at that moment that Sakura noticed the bound form of their new sensei. You better not have messed up our test, Naruto. If we fail because of you, I'll pound you into next year. How'd you do it? Naruto glared back at Sai, I played to his weaknesses and had some help. I could beat him no problem replied Sasuke. Yeah, the all great and powerful fresh out of the academy Ichiha Sasuke team is going to take down an ex Anbu captain by himself. That's about as likely as me drowning in Raymond in the next 5 seconds. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, guess what? It didn't happen. Before he could reply, Sasuke was interrupted by a male voice, screaming, no until Tenten walked up and kicked him in the ribs, thus silencing him again. Oh, hi Ten-chan. Hi Naruto, this is Hiro Kakashi's team. Don't call Kakashi sensei that yelled Sakura. Look here, Pinky, you really want to know how we knocked your sensei out. Yeah Sakura yelled back and tried as he might otherwise, even Sasuke looked interested. Well, first Naruto led him around for a while with a trail of books, and then he distracted him with more books and a hinge, and then I got him in the neck with a sleeping dart. 
I can't believe I fell for that Kakashi broke in, having allowed the air to return to his lungs. You tricked Kakashi sensei with book Sakura ask incredulously. Yeah, they're not even good books either Naruto said, tossing Kakashi's prized itch of itch of book to her, see. Sakura opened it and flipped through a few pages. Her cheeks then took on a light pink. She flipped a few more pages. Her face turned red. A few pages beyond that, and her face was so red she could barely remain standing. This prompted the rest of them to look over her shoulder at what she was reading, and it didn't take long for similar reactions to develop in the rest of them, except for Sai. He just looked at the book and said, it describes two adults having love. What's the big deal? Naruto leaned over Tenten's ear, he's definitely gay. Tenten just nodded, still in shock over what Kakashi read publicly. Naruto, I take back most of what I yelled at you about you being a pervert. Hiro Kakashi is way worse than you are Tenten eventually whispered into his ear, while absentmindedly twirling some bells around her finger. It was about this time when Sasuke realized that Tenten had Kakashi's bells, and Naruto and Tenten realized that Kakashi was out of most of the ropes binding him. Him those bells Sasuke ordered. No Tenten replied. She glanced over at Naruto, who had begun edging away from the group. Once she caught his attention, she signaled him to cover their retreat, and she then shouted out, you gotta take them from me at the same time Naruto shouted out, cage bunch and no jutsu. The surrounding area was suddenly flooded with Naruto clones, allowing the original Naruto and Tenten to escape. Sasuke, Sakura, and Sai immediately chased them. Well, Sasuke chased them, Sakura chased Sasuke, and Sai just followed after both of them, because he had nothing else better to do. For some reason, Naruto and Tenten were overcome with fits of giggles as they ran away, and they soon fell into a heap, laughing too hard to stand up anymore. This is what Sasuke saw when he caught up to them, making him instantly furious. Give me the bells. Nah, team, he he, pull the stick out of your mouth and have some fun, he 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 Naruto said in between giggles. Besides Tenten added, I left the bells with Hiro Kakashi. Sasuke just screamed and took off back towards his sensei, almost knocking Sakura over and shoving Sai into a tree so hard he was knocked out. Naruto and Tenten just looked at each other for a minute and burst out laughing again. That night, Naruto did not dream. Instead, as soon as he fell asleep, he found himself inside his mind and immediately tracked his way to the cage. When he got there, he found Kai Ubi in her human form, thinking intently. As he approached, she spoke, Naruto, I think it's time I teach you something. Really he asked, becoming very excited. Yes. Every day you display more features of the kitsune dot she stopped there, seeing Naruto's face fall. Realizing what he must be thinking, she continued, I do not mean physically. It's more in the way you act. Your aptitude at pranking others is an example of this. So is your loyalty to your friends. It soon may be known for trickery, but if you ever earn the loyalty and respect of one, that bond is for life. Oh, I thought you meant I was going to turn into a fox. Well, I can teach you how to do that, if you want. Huh? You see my form now, how it is a mix of human and demon forms. It is called a hand you form, half demon, and half human. Normally it is not possible for a human to make a true transformation like this. Human chakra lacks the potency to make the shape shift true, limiting it to an illusion. Demonic chakra is far more potent than human chakra, so it can affect a full shape shift. So I would have tails and ears like you. Well, you would only have one tail, but yes. It is called Fusion Kitsu no Jutsu. Partial Fox Technique. Does it do anything else? Yes. It increases all of your senses, especially sound and smell. Your nails grow into claws, and your body becomes more flexible, stronger, and a little faster. Your canine teeth will extend slightly as well. What are the seals for it? Seals? Yeah, what hand seals do I need to do it? Oh, there aren't any. How would a kitsune in their true form do these hand seals without hands? Then how do I do it? I will guide your chakra. Come over here and sit down. Naruto went over to the fox and sat down in front of her. This will hurt the first time. Your body is not used to channeling demonic chakra, so it will have to adjust. Now, turn around. Naruto turned away from the fox, and she put her hands on his shoulders. Now, close your eyes. I want you to picture yourself in form. Got it. Erm um, yeah, I got it. Now hold it. If the pain becomes too much, you will lose the image in your mind, and they will fail. Don't be disappointed if that happens. It will just take some time for your body to get used to my chakra. Are you ready? Uh, I guess Naruto replied. Ayubi began to channel her chakra through Naruto's body, controlling it to effect the correct transformation. She could feel Naruto's body tense up under her hands, as well as heat up slightly. She couldn't see it, but she knew his face had a painful grimace on it. Before long, a translucent red chakra shell began to form around his body. It got darker and darker, until it became solid. The pain suddenly spiked, causing Naruto to scream out, but he somehow managed to keep his focus on the mental image. Eventually, the chakra shell cracked, and it revealed a transformed Naruto. 
He had two white-tipped red ears on top of his head and a white-tipped red tail behind him. He gingerly reached his hands up to where his ears were supposed to be and found only hair. He then reached around and grabbed his tail, making him yelp in surprise from the pain. Careful. Those are real parts of you now. If they get injured, you will feel it. Ah. Don't yell, Kaiyu-chan Naruto whispered out harshly, hands covering his ears. I wasn't she whispered back, that's just your new ears working. When you wake up, I want you to get some dark sunglasses, earplugs, and a nose plug. Go out in the woods somewhere and put them on, and then use this again. You need to get used to the upgraded senses in a controlled manner. I would start with hearing, then vision, and then smell, okay? Okay. Anything else? Ayubi just shook her head, so Naruto took off, ready to start his new training. The next day, Naruto flew through his apartment, trying to find the items he needed to train and using his new dot he didn't have any earplugs, but he figured that some bandages wrapped around his ears would work just as well. To cover his eyes he grabbed his old goggles, which had very dark lenses on them. He couldn't find any nose plugs either, so he just grabbed some more bandage material to stuff up his nostrils. He then bounded out into the woods near where his team was meeting spot. He picked a small clearing just in view of the fence surrounding the forest of death. As much as he and Tenten had asked, Anko-sensei refused to take them there yet, saying that most Chunin didn't like it, so why should one genin and one student like it? It just made them want to go in more, of course. Anyway, Naruto put his goggles on and stuffed some of his bandage material up his nose. It was rather disorienting. He was about to wrap his ears up when he remembered that it wouldn't do any good since his ears moved when he transformed. So, he left his ears uncovered and began to focus his chakra. It went a lot easier this time and wasn't near as painful. There was a slight smoke cloud when the transformation finished, but it quickly dissipated. It revealed Naruto rolling around on the ground with his hands covering his ears, trying to block out all the noise. A few hours later, and his ears were relatively used to the noise of a quiet clearing. He couldn't handle normal speaking noise yet, but he figured it was good enough for the moment. Next he closed his eyes and slowly removed his tinted goggles. He immediately had to squeeze his eyes shut to block out the sun. Once his eyes were used to the light enough for him to open them, he was surprised at the level of detail he could see. He could see ants on the trees across the clearing as if he was right next to them. Whoa. Having by then realized that it was better to go slow, Naruto gently tugged the bandage plugs out of his nose a little bit. The scents he recognized as forest Y, but there were new ones there too. Instead of just a general forest smell, he could smell the different kinds of trees, the dirt he was standing on, and even himself. As he pulled the wads out farther, he began to pick up on fainter smells, like some really bad smelling stuff from the other side of the fence around the forest of death. He even thought he was getting some smells from the village itself, although he was far too inexperienced at telling them apart. As he waited, he also began to pick up on animal smells. Hmm, let's see, that one's a bird, I think oh, squirrel. Hmm. Oh, you. There's even dog pee. This place must be closer to the park than I thought let's see, Mausu, I can't tell that one weapon oil wait, weapon oil. What kind of animal smells like weapon oil? Wait now it's dango and snakes. That's Anko sensei, so the weapon oil must be Ten-chan. Better go wait for them before they come looking for me. Naruto then cancelled his and walked out of the woods to where Tenten and Anko were waiting. Anko looked over as Naruto walked out of the woods, whatcha doing in there, brat? Training he replied. In the woods Tenten asked. Yeah, it's new, but it isn't done yet. Oh, what's it to do? I'm not telling yet, it's not done. Well, it's done, but I'm not very good with it yet. Alright brats, how'd your test go needless to say, Anko was fairly shocked when Naruto and Tenten looked at each other and fell over laughing. When they had managed to slightly control themselves, Naruto told Anko about what they did to Team 7. So what you two brats did was to trick Hiro Kakashi with a big stack of porn, knock him out, and then parade him in front of his genin. Yup. Anko stared at them for a second and then fell over laughing. I wish I could have seen that perv's face she wheezed out as she laughed. He was tricked with porn by a pair of genin. Nah, you should have seen Sasuke team's face when he saw inside Kakashi's book. What? Yeah, Sakura-chan wanted to know what kind of books we tricked him with, so while he was still waking up, I gave Hiro Kakashi's book to her. She started looking through it, and her face got really red. Sasuke team and Sai Buru I, homosexual, basically Naruto is calling Sai gay, looked at it too, and Sasuke team turned red too. Sai didn't do anything, so Ten-chan and I think he's gay. What? The book was talking about two people doing dot dot adult things together, and he had no reaction at all. I mean, all he did was look at it and say something like, it describes two adults having love or something. This prompted another round of laughing from Anko. When she finished, she got their attention again. Well, since you two passed the test, we get to go on missions now. The A Naruto shouted out, real ninja missions. Don't get too excited, brat. 
new gen and gets D-rank missions, which I think shouldn't even count as missions. You get to do stuff like fix fences, weed gardens, and go shopping for old people. What? Those aren't missions. I know, brat. You think I'm gonna enjoy watching you two do a bunch of shitty chores. I'm used to going on solo assassinations, not watching two brats pull weeds. Now come on, if we get to the tower early enough, we can pick the least shitty ones. Anko then led the two grumbling gen into the tower, where they were able to pick their mission for the day. They were told to go pick up some garbage in the park, and then to go fix a fence. Once they got to the park, their jaws almost hit the floor. There was garbage everywhere. Sensei, how are we supposed to clean this up with just the three of us? The three of us aren't. The two of you are. What, you thought I was actually going to help you do this stuff? The two genin just gaped at their sensei. They had just been abandoned to clean a 12-acre park by themselves. When you get done, put the full bags here, they'll be picked up tomorrow Anko told them, tossing a box of garbage bags to Tintin, I'll be back in a couple hours to check on you then she shunshined away. What the hell? We're gonna be here all day Tenten screamed out, before getting a sudden idea and turning to Naruto, if you're new as some kind of garbage sucker, you'd better use it, finished or not, or else I'm gonna turn you into a porcupine. No, it's not a garbage sucker dot you saying that gave me an idea though. Cage bunch and no jutsu he yelled out, creating about 40 clones. Alright, each of you go grab a bag, and get to work. The faster we get done here, the sooner we can get to do something fun. Hi the clones responded, each quickly grabbing a bag and starting to stuff it with garbage. When Naruto realized that they would still be there forever, he made another 40 clones, and set them loose as well. With the 80 clones and the two of them, it didn't take nearly as long for Tenten and Naruto to clear out the park. Anko was rather shocked when she returned to the park four hours later. She was expecting to see the two brats lugging their way through the park still. This was obviously not what she found. No, what she found was Naruto and Tenten sitting on top of a small mountain of garbage bags, chatting about whatever came to mind, namely Naruto telling her about some of his pranks. How the hell did you do that so fast she asked. Oh, hi sensei, and as to how we did that so fast, stick around next time, and you can find out for yourself Naruto shouted down to her, before the genin pair jumped off the garbage mountain. What's next Tenten asked. Uh, we gotta go fix a fence. She then led them to a small house across the village. It had a garden attached, and a tree had fallen on the surrounding fence, damaging about 10 feet of it. The tree had been removed already, but the fence still had the gaping hole in it. They quickly set about fixing it, starting with planting new posts. When they finished it about an hour later, it was good as new. They spent the afternoon doing group training, with Anko sparring against both Naruto and Tenten at the same time, trying to improve their teamwork. The next day they were a little late in arriving at the tower, so they didn't get their choice of missions. Instead they were assigned to buy some old man's groceries, and to clean the park again. What? We just did that yesterday Naruto cried out. Well, it seems that some wild animals got into the bags and tore them open. Naruto just stomped out of the mission office, muttering something about animals and killing. Anko followed them to the park, which looked about the same as it did the day before, with garbage scattered across the 12-acre park. So, how'd you two do this yesterday without using it? Huh? Yeah, you're not supposed to use it on D-rank missions inside the village. HMPF, to hell with that, I'm doing this my way. And that is dot Anko asked. Like this, Taiju Cage Bunch and No Jutsu Naruto shouted out, and the whole park erupted in smoke. When it cleared, there were almost 500 Narutos in the park, and they were all staring at the original, who shouted out, alright. Every one of you picks up as much as you can carry. The bags will be over here. When you're full, dump it in a bag, and go get more. Hi they all screamed in response, and soon, Naruto and Tenten were overwhelmed by the number of Narutos bringing them garbage, and Naruto had to make more clones to hold open bags just to keep up. Anko just stared at the field of Narutos, still in awe over how many the boy could make. Eventually, she just fell into a sitting position, not able to comprehend just how he could do that without dying from chakra exhaustion. It took the Naruto army about 15 minutes to clear out the park this time, and they all dispelled in a huge smoke cloud. Naruto just blinked a few times, as all the unused chakra flowed back into his body. We're done, Sensei. Uh, yeah, okay. You okay, Sensei Tenten asked. Uh, brat, exactly how many clones can you make Anko asked. Um, oh, I don't know, a lot. We've established that, brat. Tomorrow, then, we're gonna figure out just how many of those damn things you can make. Okay, Sensei. What's the next stupid mission? Uh, we gotta go buy groceries for some old geezer. What? Why can't he go buy his own stuff? Cause he's an old geezer, that's why. Now let's go find him and get this shit over with. Hi the two genin replied, as they began following Anko to where the old geezer lived. They made it about a hundred yards from the garbage pile before Naruto popped a couple more clones out, and they took off back to the garbage pile. What was that for, Naruto Tenten asked. 
they're gonna watch the garbage pile and keep them stupid animals out of it, since I'm not picking all that garbage up again. That's actually a good idea, Brad. They talked about whatever came to mind on the way to find the old guy, and when they got there, Anko had to blow the door off its hinges to get him to answer. You ask for a gen and team to pick up some items for you she asked the old man, trying to be somewhat respectful. The old man looked at Anko, and then at Tenten. When his gaze hit Naruto, the seemingly kind old man started glaring at him. Anko noticed the glare, and right as the old man was about to let loose some curse at Naruto, she spoke, is there a problem? Yeah, there's a problem. There's a demon on my porch. Tenten looked around confused, while Naruto and Anko just glared at the old man. Anko was about to reply, but Naruto beat her to it. Listen, geezer, I'm not a damn demon. My name is Yuzumaki Naruto. You're a demon. He's my student, stupid, now shut up before I kill you Anko spat out, you got a problem with him, you got a problem with me. HMF, the demon has bewitched you. You're nothing but a snake whore, along with your other demon whore student. What did you just say Naruto asked quietly, the intensity of his glare surprising even Anko. You heard me, demon, them two are demon who. He was cut off from speaking more when he found Naruto's first lodged firmly in the middle of his face. Listen, you stupid dumb, you can insult me all you want, but you do not insult my team Naruto, then crawled off the collapsed geezer and kicked him in the crotch for good measure. He was about to kick him again when Anko grabbed him, and after grabbing Tenten, they took off. Naruto Anko began. What he yelled back. You can't just go around assaulting civilians like that. What? How can you be defending that nonsense? You heard what he said. As I said, you can't just go around punching people who insult you. Oh, I don't care what he says about me. I punched him because of what he called Ten-chan. I kinda figured, and while it most certainly isn't nice to call a woman a whore, you went about fixing it the wrong way. Well what was I supposed to do? You let me deal with it. Well I will admit drilling him in the face like that and then following it up with that kick to his crotch is an effective way to cause pain and humiliation, I know far better ways to make people miserable. Next time, let me handle it, okay? Dot dot fine he replied, crossing his arms. Naruto Tenten asked, speaking for the first time since she heard Naruto be called a demon. Yeah, Ten-chan he replied. Why did he call you a demon? Why did he call you a demon? Naruto stopped dead, as did Anko, and Tenten stopped a few steps later. But Naruto asked quietly, his eyes firmly stuck to the ground, his right hand unconsciously clenching his jacket at the stomach. I asked, why did that old guy call you a demon? And Anko-sensei, why did he call you a snake you know, and why did he call me a demon? Anko looked down at Tenten, noticing that her expression was just honest curiosity, as well as some hurt from the man's biting words. She next looked at Naruto, and she could tell that he was struggling greatly with whether or not he should tell her about his demon. Naruto looked up at her, and she could clearly see the warring choices on his face. One side telling her that she would understand, and the other not wanting to risk losing his only real friend over the demon in his gut. As she watched his face, she noticed a third emotion run across it. It took her a second to identify it, but when she did, she realized that it had two parts to it. The first was the same honest curiosity that Tenten had as to why she was called a snake whore, and the second was him silently asking her opinion as to whether or not he should tell Tenten about the fox. They looked at each other for a few moments, and then Anko made up her mind. Turning to Tenten, she said, I will tell you too why he called me a snake whore, provided that you don't talk about it to other people. It is a dot difficult topic for me to discuss. Now come on, follow me. She then set off down the road at a moderate walk, easily allowing the otherwise mentally occupied Jenin to easily keep up with her. They were headed in the general direction of the tower, until Anko suddenly made a right turn, which surprised them, Naruto more so than Tenten. His surprise only grew as they neared their destination, for they were very near to his apartment. When they finally stopped outside a group of them, Naruto realized that Anko only lived about four blocks from where he did. Sensei, why are we here Tenten asked. Anko took a deep breath, and after releasing it said, I live here. If you want me to talk, this is where I'm going to do it. Dachi then led the pair up the second floor and to a rather nondescript apartment door. She reached out to it, but before she opened it she said, this is my safe haven, I would appreciate it if you didn't talk about where I live either. This of course confused the hell out of Tenten, but Naruto understood her perfectly, although he didn't yet know why she would need one. After all, his apartment was his sanctuary too. Anko then opened the door and led them into the apartment. They were quite surprised at how normal it looked. They had both assumed, based on how she dressed, how she acted in public, and the fact that she worked in the torture and interrogation department that her home would be dot dot well dot dot creepy, but it was quite normal, for a ninja anyway. The walls were white, and the carpet was apartment standard beige. There was a couch with a matching chair in front of a small TV, as well as a bookcase full of scrolls. Anko led them over to the couch, and then went into the kitchen to get them all some water to drink, since that was all she had at the time. 
When she returned, she sat in the chair and began her tale. The reason that old geezer called me a snake whore stems from who my sensei was and what he did she told them, and they clearly picked up on her dislike for whoever her sensei was, as they both felt that if she spat the term out with any more hatred, then whoever it was would keel over stone dead just from that. I never graduated from the academy like most students do. I was pulled out two years early by my sensei because he thought I had too much potential to waste it in the academy. Well that is normally not allowed, my sensei was able to do it based on who he was, so you see my sensei was the Sanin Arachimaru. At the time, I was beyond ecstatic that I was chosen by a Sanin to work with. I had just been hand-picked by one of the strongest ninja ever to be his apprentice. Both of my parents had died by then, and he became a sort of surrogate father to me. Anyway, I trained under him for a long time, almost two years. It was around then that we were given a simple delivery mission to sea country, and that changed everything. I didn't know it at the time, but there were rumors spreading around the higher ranking ninja that Orochimaru was kidnapping people and experimenting on them. I only ever heard a few of them, but immediately dismissed them as the supporters of the fourth trying to discredit him, since the third chose him over Orochimaru. So, we set off on our mission to see country, along with two other genin that had been assigned to our group. The trip there was uneventful, as was the delivery of the scroll we had. We were supposed to leave the next day to come back, but Orochimaru told us that he had an old friend who lived near there and he wanted to visit. Where he took us though, was not a friend's house. He took us to a bunker he had there near the beach and began to perform experiments on us. I don't remember what all he did, but by the time he was done, the other two genin were dead and I had been branded by that nonsense. Naruto and Tenten looked up at her, branded. Anko pulled the collar of her trench coat off the left side of her neck and showed them the curse mark that she said, as she sat back down, is his brand. It is supposed to give the user some huge benefit, but mine doesn't work. I learned later that I was one of his guinea pigs for testing it. There is an extremely high fatality rate to anyone he applies that seal to, somewhere around 90%. Anyway, I woke up a few days later inside a shed, which is where he dumped me before fleeing sea country. I managed to get to the nearest village, and they sent for some med nins to come get me. I was still in the hospital during the Kaiubi attack, and after I got out, people began to glare at me, shout curses at me, shops would refuse me service and overcharge on whatever they let me buy. Turns out that the rumors about that nonsense experimenting on people were true, and that after he had abandoned me to die in that shed, he had briefly returned here, before being confronted by Siratobi sama about his actions in relation to several disappearances. The nonsense somehow managed to escape and then fled the village. The reactions of her students were strange, although not unexpected. Tenten was in shock, especially since it was one of the Sanin that had done those things, and Naruto was quietly staring at his lap, thinking about all the abuse that he had gone through growing up, as well as the kinds of things that Anko had just described going through. Surprisingly, to Anko anyway, Naruto spoke next, so they hated you because of who your sensei was, MHMM. Many of the villagers thought I was some kind of spy, especially since I had his mark. Earning their trust back and gaining the rank of Chunin and later on Takibetsu Jounin were not easy, and there are still some villagers that don't like me, as you saw earlier. She paused for a few moments, then said, I don't really know why I decided to tell you this. You are now among only a handful of people to know about this, and I would prefer to keep it that way. Even when I brought you here, I did not intend on telling you that much. Normally it is a very difficult topic for me to discuss, but I find it a lot easier to tell you too about it. But why the snake Naruto asked. That geezer called me a snake whore because that is the kind of animal I use. Nonsense sensei is the snake Sanin, and he taught me many of his snake jutsu. Oh. I guess that makes sense. They all went quiet for a while, until Naruto noticed Tenten looking at him, waiting for him to tell his part of the story. I know why I am called a demon he said quietly, and the reason you were called that name is because you were around me. But why though? I. I'll tell you tomorrow. There are some things I have to do before I can tell you. Can you wait until then he asked. Yeah, sure. Naruto was waiting in Saratobi's office when Anko and Tenten showed up. He was sitting on the desk while Saratobi reclined in his chair. The new arrival sat and Naruto began his tale. He lifted up his shirt and channeled some chakra, causing his seal to appear. This is why that old geezer called me a demon he said simply. Anko and Saratobi both had sympathetic looks while Tenten was confused, he called you a demon because you have a seal. Naruto shook his head, it's not because I have a seal, it's because of what is in it. You have something sealed inside you? Naruto slowly nodded his head. What is it? You know when my birthday is, right Tenten? Yeah, October 10th. What else happened on October 10th? The Kaiubi attacked. Naruto watched her face as she slowly realized what he was saying. The Kaiubi's dead. Naruto shook his head. It was too powerful for the fourth to kill it, so he sealed it in me. Tenten sat there in shock. 
Her best friend had the most powerful demon ever sealed inside of him. It's okay if you don't want me to be around you anymore. I'll just find a different team and, boy, Brett, shut up Anko said, cutting Naruto off. Just because you told her doesn't mean she automatically hates you. Let her answer first. Oh, and since when did I say you could transfer to another team? But Sensei, no buts brat, buns here just need to have some time to get used to the fact that you got that damned oversized furball sealed in your gut. She hates being called that dot Naruto muttered. Ayanko asked, trying to figure out if Naruto was insulting her. I said she hates being called an oversized furball. Wait, she? And how do you know that? I know because I've talked to her, and she can hear and see everything that I do. Can you talk to Kaiubi Tenten asked, still trying to come to grips with the situation. Yeah, she's really nice too, just ask Jai Chan, he's met her. Anko and Tenten looked at the Hokage, who said, yes, I have met Kaiubi. While I am not entirely certain of her motives, she does not seem to bear Naruto any ill will. She greatly accelerates the rate of his healing of her own free will. Whether or not this is because she cares about Naruto or is just doing it for self-preservation I do not know. Hey brat, what all do you talk to the fox about? Uh, whatever comes to mind when I go there. It's not like I can talk to her whenever, only when I'm sleeping or knocked out. What does the fox tell you? Well, right now she's training me. But Siratobi broke in. I said the Kaiu-chan is teaching me stuff. Like what the old man asked harshly. Well, so far I've only learned one jutsu, and it's not done yet. What does it do? Well, it kinda makes me look a little like a fox, and it makes my senses a lot better. Look like a fox Anko asked. Yeah, it's called Fusen Kitsu no Jutsu, and it looks like this Naruto said, well he put on the form of the Jutsu. The other three people were quite surprised at the form Naruto was in. Anko spoke first, okay, I get the ears, but why the tail? Well, I learned some more about it last night, and the tail is supposed to help me balance. The ears help me hear better, and the claws are supposed to help me fight better he said, showing them his fingernails, which had lengthened into claws. Oh, I can see and smell better, and I guess I can taste better too, but I haven't eaten anything like this. What did you mean by it not being finished yet? Well, I can't really use it yet since I'm not used to the new senses. Everything is too loud, too bright, or smells too strong. Once I get good with this one, Kaiu chan said she would teach me the next form, too. Next form? Yeah, the next form lets me change all the way into a fox, but she hasn't told me anything else about it. She said my chakra control isn't good enough for that yet. So you have the Kaiubi sealed inside you Tenten said, finally coming to terms with Naruto's revelation. The yeah, Naruto said quietly, waiting for her to continue. It attacked the village and killed people, including my parents, and then the fourth sealed it inside you she continued. Aha. Uh -huh. She killed my parents too he replied. Why? Why? I don't know, Ten Chan, she hasn't told me yet Naruto whispered out. It was at that point that Tenten was overwhelmed by her emotions. She may be a ninja, but she was still a young teenage girl. Tears began to fall from her eyes, and she was holding back sobs. Her eyes themselves, though, only showed anger. Naruto slid off the Hokage's desk to comfort her, even though he knew he was the source of her negative emotions. She jumped up as soon as he was standing, hands clenched into fists. What do you mean she hasn't told you Tenten shouted, go make her tell you. I can't Naruto responded quietly, no matter what I do, she won't tell me until she's ready to. That was the last straw for Tenten. That's not good enough she screamed, launching herself at him. She began hammering her fists into his chest, but due to her emotional distress, they didn't hurt Naruto very much. After a few moments of letting her vent her frustrations, Naruto wrapped his arms around her, holding her to his chest, and trapping her arms between them. SHHHH he whispered into her ear as she continued to struggle, as soon as she tells me, you'll be the first to know, I promise. Eventually, Tenten looked up at Naruto, you mean it she half whispered, half sobbed to him. Naruto looked back at her, of course I do, Ten-chan. They went quiet for a few minutes, not even Anko or Suratobi interrupting, until Tenten pulled back from Naruto and asked, how long have you known? About the fox, since I was seven he said quietly, the question bringing back several flashes of that night. Seeing the raw emotion pass across his face, Tenten spoke out, Naruto. Sorry he replied, it's just that some bad things happened the night I found out about the fox, and I don't like talking about it. It's okay. I'll wait until you're ready. Now then Siratobi spoke up, scaring both Naruto and Tenten, since they forgot he was there. What Naruto has just told you is an S-rank secret. If I find out that you've told anybody who doesn't already know about it, you will be executed as soon as physically possible. Do you understand? Tenten looked at the old man, ha <laughs> hi. Alright then, my next question will probably seem insensitive, but both Anko and I must know, so I will be blunt. Will this revelation affect your ability to work with Naruto? Tenten thought for a moment, I don't think so. I hate the fox, not Naruto, and it can't get free, right? Naruto shook his head. Even if she wanted to, it would kill us both if she tried. 
alright, then said Anko. We've got training to do. Then Naruto and Tenten both asked, the emotional rollercoaster of the last couple days, making a small part of them think they'd get at least one day off. You heard me brats. Today is the beginning of bigger, sharper training. Naruto, Tenten, and Suratobi all sweat dropped at the name Anko chose for weapon training. Meet me at the usual spot in two hours she said, before poofing out of the office. Well then Saratobi said after the smoke cleared, I was going to give you a couple days off to adjust to the new information, but Anko doesn't seem to think you need it. If you decide later on that you do need some time, though, don't hesitate to come and ask for it. Thank you, Hokage-sama. Yeah, thanks Jai-chan. Now, I'm sure you two have much more entertaining things to do than sitting in an old man's office. Enjoy your training he told them, and they got up to leave. Not having anywhere in particular to go, they headed off in the general direction of their training ground. I feel kinda out of place here Tenten said eventually. Huh? Why Naruto asked, immediately thinking she was about to tell him that she wanted off the team. Well, it's just that you and Sensei have these really huge secrets, and I don't. I've spent two days listening to you spill out the darkest bits of yourselves, and I have nothing like that to tell you about me. Naruto was quiet for a few moments, and then said, you really want to have a burden like us. Well, I just feel bad that you both have to deal with them and I don't. Now that I know about them, I wanna help. Trust me, Ten-chan Naruto said quietly, our burdens are far more trouble than they're worth. What do you mean? What do you think she does for me Naruto asked, gripping the front of his coat. Well, you said that she's training you, and that you can talk to her, why? She also is the reason I'm banned from almost everywhere in the village. In fact, there are only a few stores that let me in, and most of them make me pay more for older stuff. She's part of the reason I did so badly in the academy, the reason I was hated so much at the orphanage, and almost got me killed. Yeah, she is training me, heals me really fast, and is talking to me, but that's only been since I was seven, and the training just started. Fenton was in shock. She knew he had it rough, but she didn't know it was this bad. So the reason you made you own stealth suit, yeah, I'm not allowed in that store he replied quietly. Why didn't you try Henge? That's how I got the scraps, but why should I have to hide who I am just to go buy stuff? Oh. It's okay, Ten Chan. I've used Henge before, but I really don't like doing it. I just kinda feel like I'm lying to myself when I do that. They kept talking as they wandered their way to the training grounds, and the rest of the time passed swiftly. When Anko arrived, they immediately stopped talking, instead deciding to stare at the boxes she was holding. On her left shoulder was a box about 5 foot long, and there were 3 more boxes in a bundle in her right hand. When she got to the genin, she tossed the long box at Naruto, and after setting the bundle down, tossed him the top box as well. The other two were promptly tossed to Tenten. Sensei, are these what we think they are? Tenten asked. Yup, Whiskers got a 5 foot bow staff and 2 tantos, and you got a katana and a set of nunchaku. Just so you know, though she said, catching the mischievous looks in their eyes, these are cheap ones. If you wail on them too hard they will break. I got you these to learn with, not to go hacking away at stuff like a couple of buffoons, got it? They both nodded, and then dove into their boxes. What they found only confirmed what Anko had just told them. They definitely weren't top of the line items, that was for sure. That's not to say they were beat up, though. She may not have spent a lot on them, but they were new. It's just that they were plain dot and all black dot dot and had no distinguishing features whatsoever. What Anko said when the two looked up at her confused. Why are they all plain black? Anko glared at the two genin. You have a problem with it, you can give them back and go buy your own. Naruto and Tenten glanced at each other quickly before blurting out, no, they're perfectly fine sensei. Yeah, that's what I thought. Now, I want you each to pick one of your weapons and prepare to defend yourselves. The next two weeks were hell for the two genin. Anko mercilessly pounded on them, all the while teaching them the proper ways to use their weapons. She didn't teach them any complicated forms or strings of motions to go through. She taught them by beating the shit out of them on a daily basis, thus allowing them to figure out on their own what worked and what didn't. That's not to say she didn't instruct them. She pointed out their flaws as she beat on them. Often, she would have them spar between themselves while she circled them, often stopping them to correct things that they were doing wrong or suggesting ways to do things better. If their swings got too wild, she would stop them from killing or maiming each other. Still, they progressed quickly. By the end of the two weeks Anko determined that they were good enough with their respective weapons to begin carrying them when not training. This was a very good thing, because that morning, as soon as Anko arrived at their designated meeting spot, she told them that the Hokage had them. What's Jai-chan want with us now? Oh. Maybe he's gonna give us some kick missions. HMPF, I doubt it, but. It hasn't been long enough for us to get the good missions. Way to be optimistic Sensei Tenten said sarcastically. Well, if Jai-chan gives us another stupid D-rank mission I'm gonna go insane, especially if we have to chase that damned cat again. Next time I find that nonsense I'm gonna kill it. 
Boy brat calm down, do you think you have it bad doing D ranks, how do you think I feel? I was doing A rank solo assassination missions before I got saddled with your sorry faces. Hey haha, <laughs> sorry sensei Naruto replied. The rest of the trip to Saratobi's office was quiet and they were admitted as soon as they arrived. Boy, Jai Chan, you got a kick mission for us this time, right? Not a stupid D rank. Damn it brat, what did I just tell you? You're too young for better missions. Actually the old man replied, well I do have a mission for you, it isn't a D rank. Naruto started bouncing around the room, failing miserably to contain his excitement. Really he asked excitedly. Yes, Naruto. The mission I want to send you on is actually a B rank. Eh. Uh, Anko sputtered out. They aren't ready for a C rank, let alone a B. Relax, Anko. I'm sending your team out to back up Team 7, who are escorting a bridge builder back to his home in Wave Country. They ran into some unexpected opposition and have requested aid. Ianko barked out, cutting Naruto off from agreeing to the mission without hearing all the details. Describe unexpected opposition. Uh, according to Kakashi's report, they were ambushed by the Demon Brothers. The thoughtful look dropped on Anko as she pondered whether or not to accept the mission. Hmm, they sent Chunin, and they failed she thought out loud, so next will be at least one Jounin, or a Jounin with Chunin, but probably only a Jounin or two dot dot him. She thought about it for a few more minutes, while her Jenin anxiously waited for her answer. If we agree to this, and I'm not saying we are yet, how far behind them are we? Only a few hours, I called for your team as soon as I read Kakashi's report. They left yesterday morning. Anko thought about it some more before asking, is there any other information available? Yes, in his report, Kakashi stated that Tazuna, the man they are escorting, mentioned that Wave Country is under the stranglehold of a man named Gato. I think it's safe to assume that the Demon Brothers were hired by him. As in the billionaire Gato Anko asked. Hi, if you want more info, you'll have to go ask Tazuna himself. Anko pondered for a few more minutes, before looking the old Hokage directly in the face. Alright, we'll take it. The rest of Anko's statement was drowned out by Naruto yelling Yada at the top of his lungs while he jumped around the room, seemingly oblivious that he would most likely be facing opponents far stronger than he was on this mission. Boy, Brat shut up Anko yelled as she bashed him on the head, causing him to fall to the floor and clutch his abused scalp. She turned back to face the Hokage, who was smiling at the antics before him. Is there anything else you wanted to add? No, just be careful. If you feel like you're in over your heads, send a message and I will dispatch further reinforcements. Anko nodded to the old man before turning to the genin. Alright, brats, go grab enough shit to last you for two weeks, and then get yourselves to the gate. You have one hour or I'm leaving without you. Hi they both yelled, before vanishing from the office. 45 minutes after leaving the Hokage's office, Team Anko leapt into the trees outside Kanoha's gate. Nah, sensei, how long do you think it'll take us to catch up to them? Not long, brat. They have to walk, since they have to escort da da da. Whatever that guy's name was. I think it was Tanzuni or something. I know it started with Team Naruto added. Ugh, I can't believe you two Tenten growled, Team 7 is escorting a man named Tizuna. See Ten-chan? I knew it started with a T. Tenten just hung her head. I can't believe them, well maybe Naruto, but Sensei too. It's supposed to be her job to remember this kind of stuff, not mine. She would have kept following that particular line of thought, but she was interrupted when Anko suddenly shoved her. What did you do that for? Well, excuse me for not letting you run into a tree. Oh, thank you, Sensei. Gee, just make sure you don't drop anything. Hey. It's Naruto who keeps dropping stuff. Since they had left the village gates, Naruto had to stop almost a dozen times to pick up various bits of his equipment that had fallen off. Most of the time it was his bow, which only made Tenten make fun of it more, since he couldn't even seem to carry it properly. Naruto's staff wasn't traveling well either. It was five feet long, and he had no way to shrink it down, and it was too long to strap to his body. The two Tanto knives he had were giving the least trouble, as they were crossed on his back, with the handles over his shoulders. A quiver of arrows hung over them, and his bow hung from the quiver. Tenten wasn't having any real problems with her weapons. She had attached her katana to her left hip and had the nunchaku in a holder on her back. She also had close to a hundred kunai and shuriken hidden in various places in her clothes. When she had mentioned this fact to Naruto, he first expressed shock that she carried so damn many. This lasted until his brain managed to wrap itself around her carrying so many sharp things, and he began to doubt that she could physically carry that many weapons without them being noticeable. His doubt was promptly killed as Tenten pulled out 103 kunai, as well as 107 shuriken. It took him almost five full minutes to be able to speak again, and a further ten minutes before he could form a complete sentence. Naruto, of course, had thought he was carrying a lot, since he had thirty of each spread around his clothes. 
he had immediately asked Anko, who replied that while a hundred of each seemed excessive, even for her, she normally carried around 50 of each in her trench coat. Naruto had been pouting all the way until Tenten almost crashed into the tree. Seeing that it pulled him out of his mini depression and he started laughing at Tenten. When she heard him laughing, she just chucked a kunai at him, and while it didn't hit him, it did cause his bow to fall again. They continued on for another hour or so, until Anko signaled them to drop to the road they had been traveling next to. After they all ended on the road, Naruto spoke up, Nah, why did we stop here? We've almost caught up to Kakashi. We're only a few miles from them, and we're gonna take the road until we get to them. Why? The trees would be faster. Because, brat, if we take the trees and just appear next to them, his brats will probably freak out and try to attack you. I will let them try. I can take the team any day of the week. Anko just raised an eyebrow, not knowing who Naruto was talking about. Tenten was the only one who noticed it and replied, that would be Ichiha Sasuke. I don't really know why, but Naruto calls him team. I call him team because that's what he is. Besides, even if team, Burupo I and Sakura all ganged up on me, I could still kick them. Anko's eyebrow went up higher. Burupo I. What in the hell made him decide to name someone gay? Ugh. It's I. Naruto calls him Burupo I, homosexual, because Sai has a fixation on talking about body parts. Anko just laughed at them both, Naruto for his immature nicknames, and a Tenten. Betting her laughter under control, Anko took off down the road towards Kakashi and his team. They may not have been tree hopping anymore, but they were still going pretty fast, compared to Kakashi and his group, who had to travel at civilian speed. When they got close enough, Anko sent out a small snake to warn Kakashi of their approach. It returned quickly, and they began to walk up to Kakashi's camp. Kakashi wasn't really enjoying this mission, nor was he really enjoying this team. When he had agreed to take a genin team this year, he had asked for a combat team. What he got was anything but. Combat teams are designed to be frontline fighters. They need to have relatively large chakra reserves and passably descent control over them, jutsu that worked against single enemies as well as large groups, and be capable at some form of tojutsu. Being able to work together was a must, as combat teams by nature didn't fall back or retreat unless they absolutely had to. The only one of his genin that was even close to that was Sasuke, and even he wasn't a very good match. Sasuke had a relatively large amount of chakra for his age, but only average control over it. His tojutsu was the best out of the three, but it was still lacking, since he hadn't activated his Sharingan yet. His teamwork abilities were also borderline non-existent, since all he cared about was avenging his clan. Sai wasn't a bad ninja, he just didn't fit the kind of team he wanted. Sai's skills lay in mid to long range combat and support. He didn't have any heavy hitting jutsu, only had average reserves and average control. His tojutsu wasn't anything to write home about. His personality didn't help him either. He either ignored the others or made crude jokes at their expense. Sakura, though, was a complete mess. Given a little time and some properly structured lessons, both Sai and Sasu could be molded into members of a combat team. Sakura could not. Her chakra reserves were so small as to be almost worthless. Her tojutsu was so bad that she would be lucky to beat a four-year-old, and besides Henge, Kawarimi, and Bushin, she had no techniques at all. All of her attention and time was devoted to trying to impress Sasuke, who she obviously didn't realize didn't care about her. The Kashi was beyond shocked when they managed to pass his bell test, although he still wasn't sure how they pulled it off. He had asked for a combat team and got himself a banshee, a brooder, and well, dot dot whatever classification Sai fell into. After the demon brothers attacked, which part of him couldn't believe they lived through, he knew that they would face stronger opponents and had sent for reinforcements from Konoha. He had immediately recognized the snake as Anko's but wondered why her team had been sent. He'd honestly expected a team of Chunin to come, not a Takujo and two more Genin. Oi, Mina, our backup has arrived. His group all turned to face him, not realizing that he had called for more people. Seeing their looks, he said, after the demon brothers failed to kill Tazuna-san, I came to the conclusion that Gato will try again, and that this time he will send at least one Jounin level ninja to do it, and you three aren't ready for that level of fight. I am an Ichiha. I won't be a problem Sasu grumbled. He would have kept talking, but the sudden appearance of a kunai against his neck made him shut up. Well, now, how about that? I could have just killed you, and I'm only a Takujo. What do you say to that, Brad a voice said in his ear. The Kashi barely glanced up from his book, Hello Midorashi-san. Would you please unhand my student now? Oh, but terrorizing the brats is so much fun, speaking of which, where are yours? Anko just pointed behind her, and Naruto and Tenten emerged from the bushes. Once they were plainly visible, Anko put a kunai away. Sasu glared at them, why are you here, dope? Naruto glared right back, before smirking at him, and flung his staff across his shoulders, resting his arms on it, because Kakashi and Jai-chan don't think you're good enough to do this by yourself. This just caused Sasuke to glare harder. 
Just as he was about to open his mouth and insult Naruto some more, Kakashi said, that's enough, Sasuke. That just made Sasuke return to glaring at Kakashi. Sakura, meanwhile, had been poking fun at Naruto's weapons. Nice stick. What are you gonna do with it? Build a tent. Ha ha ha. It's not a stick. It's a staff. Sai so elected to remain silent for once. He knew the value of a good weapon, as he himself carried an Ninjato. He listened to Sakura poke fun at Naruto and Tenten for a while, until he decided to see if they were capable with their weapons. Sakura apparently hadn't noticed it yet, but Naruto also had what looked like short swords on his back. Are you any good with your weapons? Naruto stared at him for a moment, until he gave the response that Anko had drilled into them. I'm good enough. I would like to have a quick spar with you, if that's alright he said, looking at Naruto, Kakashi, and Anko in turn. Naruto looked at Anko, who just shrugged, and then at Kakashi, who said, keep it light. I don't want to have to carry you if you get hurt. That's fine. Well Sai said, turning back to Naruto. Naruto just slid into a stance with his staff, eyeing the handle of Sai's ninjato. I do not wish to fight your staff. Naruto just stood out of his stance, before tossing his staff to Anko. He then reached over his shoulders and pulled his tanto free of their sheaths, before settling back down into a stance. Sai eyed him for a few moments, as he slowly pulled his weapon out. Each of them could tell that the other was at least passingly familiar with their weapons of choice and didn't just have them for show. Before Sai got his ninjato all the way out of its sheath, which he wore behind his left shoulder, he charged at Naruto, and as he got in range, he brought it down towards the top of Naruto's head. Naruto responded by ducking and brought his own blades up to defend, catching Sai's blade with his own. Naruto held that position only for an instant before he pushed Sai's blade off to the side and lunged at him. Naruto's shoulder caught Sai in the chest, but instead of falling over, Sai went with the charge and backflipped once to remain standing. They eyed each other for a few moments, and then Naruto switched his grip so that the blades of his tanto went down and he charged at Sai. He managed to keep Sai on the defensive, not quite slashing wildly, but there was no apparent style behind his movements. Naruto also didn't stay in one place very long, if at all, and spun and jumped a lot, frequently attacking from odd angles. This went on for a short while, until Sai managed a block that left Naruto open to Sai's left fist, and Sai punched him in the jaw, sending Naruto stumbling back a few feet. Naruto quickly recovered, but before he could resume attacking Sai decided that he'd had enough. Thank you. You seem to be able to handle yourself fairly well for a beginner. How long have you been practicing with them? Naruto thought for a minute, trying to find an insult in what Sai had said. Eventually determining there wasn't one, he replied, two weeks. This surprised Sai greatly. There were still obvious skills that Naruto lacked, but for only two weeks of instruction, Naruto was doing remarkably well. What style do you use? Huh? Most people who use weapons use them in a particular way, called a style Anko cut in. It's usually the same style as the person who taught you. Anyway, Naruto and Tenten don't use any particular style, since I haven't had time to teach them one yet. The two weeks were spent in combat, getting them familiar with their weapons. They may not get the advantage from adhering to a particular style, but they will become far more unpredictable that way. Seeing Naruto display a set of skills that Sasuke lacked made him furious. Kakashi wasn't teaching them anything. All he usually did, once he decided to actually bother to show up, was tell them to spar with each other. The missions they did were pointless. There was no way in hell Itachi got as strong as he did painting fences, delivering groceries, and chasing cats around the village. Sakura was in shock. She couldn't believe that Naruto had gotten so good. Sai had never really talked much about it, but he had been using that ninjato for a few years now. For him to comment that Naruto was good at using his tanto was the most out of character thing she'd ever heard him say. Even stranger was the fact that he meant it and that there wasn't any insult in the same sentence. Despite getting odd looks from Sakura, Sai just sat back down after the spar, not saying anything. Naruto stared at him for a minute before sitting down next to Tenten. He leaned next to her and whispered, that was weird. What? The fact that he wanted to fight you she whispered back. No. He didn't insult me during the fight. Tenten thought about it for a second, wow. You're right. They were interrupted when they noticed that Anko was asking Kakashi about the mission so far. They listened quietly while the masked man told them about their meeting with Tezuna, the encounter with the demon brothers, and Tezuna's story. Naruto, Tenten, and Anko were all surprised by the story, especially how well Sasuke and Sai fought the demon brothers. Anko and Kakashi then began to talk about things that were way over the genin's heads, so Tezuna went to bed, and Naruto wandered a short ways off to practice with his bow. Tenten and Sakura followed after him. So, Naruto Baka, why do you have a samurai weapon? Are kunai and shuriken not good enough for you? Naruto just glared at Sakura, I have nothing against kunai or shuriken. It just so happens that I can do more with a bow than I can with standard thrown weapons. Sakura didn't look convinced, so Naruto decided to show her instead. 
he pulled out a kunai and threw it into a tree. Oridi then said, I would like for you and Ten-chan to each throw a kunai at that tree as hard as you can. Sakura looked confused, but Tenten just whipped a kunai at the same tree, burying it halfway to the handle. Naruto and Tenten both motioned her to hurry up, so they took out a kunai of her own and launched it at the tree as hard as she could and managed to get it to sink into the tree about half an inch. Okay Naruto said as he walked up to the three kunai in the tree, we can all see that Ten-chan is the best at kunai. Yours went in a half inch, mine went in one inch, and Ten-chan's went in three inches. You injured your target, Sakura, I might have killed my target if it hit in the right spot, and Ten-chan definitely got a kill. Now, I'm going to show you what I can do with my bow. Naruto and the two girls then walked back to where they had thrown the knives from, and Naruto pulled his bow off his back. He handed it to Tenten, did some quick stretches, and then took his bow back. He then fished around in his quiver for a second, before withdrawing a single arrow. The arrow had a black shaft, and the head and feathers were a dark green. He set the arrow to the string and took a deep breath before raising it up and pulling the string back to full draw. He held it for only a second before he released the string. It gave a sharp twang, and the arrow sped towards the tree faster than Sakura could see. Naruto released his held breath and returned his bow to its position on his back. He calmly walked up to the tree and tried to pull his arrow out of the tree. He immediately realized it was hopeless, so he just snapped it off where the shaft met the bark. He pulled a whole arrow out and held it up next to the broken one. See, Sakura. I got the arrow to go 9 inches into that tree. If it were a person, it would probably be able to go through 2 or 3 people at this distance. That amount of power also provides extreme range. I can hit targets with a bow 2 to 3 times farther away than I can with a kunai, with less effort. Naruto and Tenten had gone to bed soon after their demonstration and were up early the next morning. They quickly completed their morning tasks and got back on the road. The trek during the morning was entirely uneventful, with the only highlights being Tazuna's comments about the genin. They didn't stop to eat lunch, deciding instead to eat while they walked, since Tazuna said he wasn't tired and wanted to hurry home. It wasn't until the end of lunch that things got interesting. Naruto was halfway through a cardboard-flavored ration bar when he suddenly flung it into a bush, his other hand bringing his staff in front of him as he fell into a defensive stance. What the hell was that, Naruto Baka Sakura yelled out. I heard something moving in the bushes he replied, casting his eyes about the source of the noise. Sai cautiously approached the bushes and peeked behind them. Once he saw what Naruto had thrown his ration bar at, he calmly picked up a severely startled rabbit. This is your enemy. Tenten just sweat dropped, and Sakura started to yell at Naruto some more for scaring the poor helpless bunny. Banko, however, wasn't paying attention to what Sakura was screaming about. Bakashi, it's er, and that rabbit is white. His visible eye widened, that means dot dot everyone down. Banko and the genin hit the ground, with Naruto pulling Sakura down with him, while Kakashi grabbed Tazuna. Just as they got out of its way, a giant sword went hurtling through the space the genin's necks had just been occupying, before it embedded itself in a tree. The man then appeared on the handle of the massive blade, staring down at them. He had slashed mist headband on, with a plate over his left ear. His lower face was wrapped in bandages, and he had no shirt on, just some straps that were probably used to carry his massive sword. He had arm coverings that were similar to Sasuke's, but with a white camouflage design. He wore camouflage grey pants and grey sandals, with his ankles wrapped in more of the white camo fabric. Ah! Mamachi's Abusa. One of the old Seven Swordsmen of the Hidden Mist Village Kakashi stated as he turned to face the new arrival. I want you all to stay here and guard Tazuna. Zabuza is on a far different level than who we faced earlier. That is the teamwork for this situation he told the genin, as he brought his left hand up to his forehead protector. I am going to have to go all out against him. Oh? You must be Sharingan no Kakashi Zabuza said. This confused the genin, since all of them except for Sakura knew that the Sharingan was a Chiha only, and Kakashi wasn't an Achiha. Sasuke of course was pissed, since a non Achiha shouldn't be allowed to have the almighty Sharingan. I'm here to kill the old man's abuser continued, honestly I don't care about you Kanoha Ninja, so if you let me do it to the old man, you all can leave. Akashi just finished pushing his headband up, and while keeping his left eye closed, said, I'm sorry, but we can't do that. We were hired to protect him, and it would reflect poorly on us if we just let you kill him without putting up a fight. I'm sure you can understand Dot as soon as he finished, he opened his eyes, revealing a fully mature 3 Tomo Sharingan. Oh? I'm honored that you showed me the Sharingan right off the bat. It won't help you though Zabuza replied. Eh? What's with Kakashi Sensei's eye Sakura asked. That is the Sharingan Anko replied quietly. It is the bloodline of the Achihas, and it allows the user to both predict and copy an enemy's movements, even allowing them to copy jutsu that is used in front of them. While Anko had been describing the Sharingan, Kakashi and Zabuza had continued talking, and Zabuza had grabbed his sword and leapt onto the surface of the nearby river. Ninpo. 
Kurigakur no Jutsu Zabuza said, as an unnaturally thick mist began to surround them. It was so thick that the genin could barely see each other, and they were in touching distance. Naruto and the other genin peered around in the mist, trying vainly to see where Zabuza, Kakashi, and Anko had disappeared to. Larynx, spine, lungs, liver, jugular vein, collarbone, kidney, heart, a strike at any of these points is lethal. Now, which one will I use today Zabuza said well hidden. The genin all froze, never having experienced killing intent like they were right then. None of them could move, because it was so intense. It didn't last long though, as the killing intent all but vanished one of the sources moved. Suddenly realizing that Zabuza was behind him, Naruto flung his tanto into a hasty defense, while he shoved Tenten, who was standing next to him, out of the path of the blade. He succeeded in getting her out of the path of the blade, and Zabuza's massive cleaver came into contact with Naruto's cheap tanto. Naruto tried valiantly to hold back the massive cleaver, but his cheap training blades proved no match for the giant weapon bearing down on him. Zabuza's cleaver sliced through Naruto's blades like they weren't even there. Suddenly, all background noise ceased, as far as those present were concerned. Tenten would remember it vividly for the rest of her life. She distinctly heard the slight shriek of Naruto's blades being destroyed, the clang as the severed blade ends hit the rocky ground, and a wet fleshy thump as something else landed in the road. Naruto screamed out as he fell to his knees, his right hand wrapped around the bleeding stump where his left hand used to be. When Zabuza had cut through Naruto's knives, he also cut his left hand off at the wrist. Tenten looked down at Naruto and saw him cradling his left arm. She then noticed his left hand lying in the dust, the remains of his knife still held tightly in its grasp. Naruto she screamed out, before ripping her katana out of its sheath and hacking wildly at the missing min. Zabuza just smirked under his face wraps and allowed her to drive him back a few feet before he viciously backhanded her with his left hand, sending her flying several feet and into unconsciousness. Realizing where their target was, Kakashi and Anko charged the missing nin and engaged him in a flurry of tojutsu strikes. They managed to push him a little farther away from the genin before Zabuza found enough room to swing his massive sword, causing both of his opponents to flip out of the way, lest they be chopped in half at the waist. Kakashi used the momentary lull in the battle to reveal his left eye, the three tomo of his Sharingan spinning wildly. Anko used the time to look over at Genin, and her body froze for a second when she realized that Naruto's hand was no longer attached to his arm. She then noticed that Sakura was in a shock-induced stupor. Sasuke was also in shock, but seemed at least mildly aware of his environment, and Sai was helping Naruto try and stop the blood pouring out of his wrist. For the first time in her life, she was tempted to use the power of her curse seal, but managed to fight back the urge. Instead, she launched two kunai at the charging missing nin, which were immediately followed by three large snakes from each of her sleeves. Zabuza managed to dodge the kunai and chop the heads off two of the snakes, but the remaining four snakes wrapped themselves around his chest and sunk their fangs into his upper arms. They weren't poisonous, but being bitten by four snakes at the same time still hurts like hell. The snakes began to constrict, forcing all the air out of his lungs. Kakashi charged a restrained enemy, but right as he was about to stab Zabuza in the head, he realized that water was coming out of the snake's mouths. He rammed his kunai through the bunshin's head anyway, and watched as it splashed into a puddle. Kakashi and Anko both frantically looked for wherever Zabuza disappeared to, but did not locate him in time from slamming Kakashi in the chest with the flat of his sword, launching him into the nearby river. A quick throw from Anko revealed this to be another clone. Kakashi quickly returned to the surface of the river, and as soon as his head broke the surface, he realized he was caught. The water swirled up around him, trapping him in Zabuza's water prison. He was about to yell at Anko to run, but when he saw the look in her eyes, he realized that it would just be a waste of his precious air. Anko had leveled a glare at Zabuza that would make the cage wet themselves. She didn't always show it, but she cared greatly for her two brats, and the man she was glaring at had most likely just ended Naruto's ninja career and possibly killed Tenten. She hadn't told them, but they were among the only people to know her whole history, and the only other people who knew the whole story was Siratobi, Ibiki, and Inoichi. Anko pulled out a few from some inner pocket of her trench coat and then performed an action that just about made Kakashi's eyes fall out. She buttoned her trench coat closed. Never, in his entire career as a shinobi, had Kakashi seen Anko close her coat. He had only even heard of it happening once, and the results weren't pretty. He watched Anko distribute the needles to her other hand and then noticed that she was gathering her chakra. She was gathering so much that Kakashi could see it with both of his eyes. It wasn't the normal blue either. The chakra swirling around Anko was a sickly color between purple and black, and it had an ominous feel to it. At first, it pooled around her feet, lazily circling her ankles. A few seconds later, though, and it was whipping around her so fast that it ripped her hair tie off of her head, allowing her shoulder-length purple hair to whip around in the windstorm of chakra she had encased herself in. She held the chakra storm for about 20 seconds and then seemingly vanished. 
she appeared in the same spot moments later, having destroyed all of Zabuza's clones that were hiding in the mist. Zabuza looked impressed by the display of speed, but wasn't scared or anything. His eyes suddenly widened though, as Anko hurled both hands at him, and they were traveling extremely fast. Zabuza had no choice but to release Kakashi from the water prison and try and dodge the needles, but he still took three in his left arm, immobilizing it completely. This did surprise him, since he couldn't effectively use his giant sword with only one hand. Kakashi, of course, had immediately retreated to dry land as soon as he was free of the water prison, and rapidly began forming hand seals. Taking advantage of Zabuza's momentary lapse in concentration, he launched a water dragon at him. Zabuza heard Kakashi call out the water dragon and looked over at it just as it hit him, launching him through a few trees and away from his sword, which was flung somewhere into the woods. He was just about to charge back at them when he was suddenly hit in the neck with another set of needles and he collapsed into a heap. Wow. He really did die a voice said. Bakashi looked over and saw a mist hunter nin on a tree branch. He ID masked nin for a few seconds and then jumped over to Zabuza's body, checking for a pulse. When he found none, he quietly exclaimed, huh. He really did die. Bakashi looked back up at the hunter nin, who bowed slightly to him. Thank you. I have been waiting for an opportunity to kill Zabuza for a long time. He is beyond my level, and I hadn't found an opening prior to this. The nin then shunshin it down to Zabuza's body. If you'll excuse me, I have to dispose of this body. The nin then picked up Zabuza's body and sunshine away. As soon as the hunter nin took off with Zabuza's corpse, Anko and Kakashi rushed over to the genin. Anko quickly checked Tenten while Kakashi checked Naruto. Anko was able to get a response out of Tenten, but wasn't able to wake her up. Kakashi, however, had much worse news. The way Naruto's hand had been severed did not allow for reattachment. Naruto and Sai had managed to stop most of the bleeding, so Kakashi assisted with that instead. It was then that he noticed a slight bit of red chakra surrounding the wound, and it seemed to be helping close it. Anko came over, and Kakashi just shook his head. He will live, though, right she asked quietly, as she helped Kakashi bind Naruto's arm to his chest. Yeah, he's going to live Kakashi replied, but his hand is done for. The way it was severed won't allow for a successful reattachment. I sedated him too, so he'll be out of it for a while. Anko just hung her head. Oi, Tazuna, how far is your house from here? Huh? Oh just a few miles he replied, after he came out of shock a little bit. Bakashi sealed Naruto's hand into a scroll, and then moved on to bringing Sakura and Sasuke out of their stupors. Tenten was picked up by Anko, and Kakashi picked up Naruto once his genin was moving. The trip to Tazuna's house was quiet, since all the genin were either still mostly in shock or borderline unconscious. When they got there, Tazuna knocked on the door quietly, and it was opened by a younger woman. Yes. Oh. I'm glad you made it back she yelled out, flinging her arms around Tazuna. This is my daughter, Tsunami he told the ninja. He then whispered into her ear, send Inari to his room. There are things he doesn't need to see. Tsunami looked at him confused, but quickly ushered her son to his room. It wasn't until she returned that she noticed one of the younger ninja had a slightly bloody bandage around where his left hand should be. Oh my she gasped out, is there anything we can do to help? Anko looked at Kakashi for a moment, and then Kakashi said, just a bowl of clean water and some privacy, as well as any bandages if you have them. Of course, Tusan, can you take the others to the living room? Azuna just nodded, and they all went into the house. Once in the kitchen, Tsunami quickly gathered and asked for supplies, before Kakashi and Anko motioned her out of the room. Realizing that they were going to re-bandage Naruto's stump, she quickly left. Anko set Tenten down in a chair and quickly cleaned the table off. Kakashi set Naruto down on the table and removed the bindings holding his arm against his chest. He then lifted his headband, once again exposing his Sharingan, and activated one of the few medicines he had picked up over the years, this one from his old teammate Rin. He held his green glowing hand near Naruto's wrist, and Anko began to remove the bandages. Once they were all off, they inspected Naruto's stump. It was quite clean, as Sai had evidently done a good job of removing any debris when he was first helping Naruto. Another thing that surprised them was the degree that Naruto's arm had healed already. Kakashi briefly stopped his jutsu, and Naruto's arm barely bled at all. He noticed Anko's shocked look, and quietly began to explain what he was seeing with his Sharingan. It's the fox he said quietly, I noticed some of its chakra before, and it seems to be healing him. I believe that the fox is also responsible for healing him after the incident when he was seven. What really happened? I know the gist of it, but what really went on? Bakashi stayed silent for a few minutes, until he asked, what do you know? Well, I know that some nins broke into his apartment and set him on fire, since the brat told me that much. I was showing him the academy fire technique, and he had a bad reaction to it. Other than that, all I've heard are rumors. It wasn't nins Kakashi replied, not at first, at least. It was the villagers that started the attack. They broke into his apartment and beat him up. 
they didn't stop there, though. They somehow got a hold of a kunai, most likely one of Naruto's, and cut him up with it. It's not my place to tell you the details, but it was really bad. Anyway, a couple Chunin noticed and went to investigate. When they realized that the villagers were attacking the so-called demon child they joined in and beat him up some more. One of them then lit the apartment and Naruto on fire with that jutsu and then retreated to wait for it to burn itself out before pretending to play heroes and trying to rescue him. Anko was in complete shock. It gets worse, though. Naruto had passed out at some point during the attack and came into contact with the fox while he was unconscious. Which one of them acted next is unclear, but one of them took control of his body, crawled over to the window, and jumped out of it. It was shocking enough that he was still alive, but to find him still breathing after falling out of a fourth-story window was beyond comprehension. Anko just collapsed into a chair. She knew the attack had been bad, but had no idea that it was that bad. While she was trying to come to terms with that, though, Tenten began to stir. Ugh Tenten mumbled out as she began to wake up. Bakashi went over to her and began a simple diagnostic jutsu while Anko talked to her. Hey, how do you feel? Ugh, like someone dropped the academy on my head she mumbled back out while gingerly bringing her hands up to her head. Anko looked up at Kakashi, who told her she should be fine in a little while. She had a minor concussion, but most of the swelling is gone already. Anko took a deep breath and let it out quickly. Sensei Tenten asked. What? How's Naruto? Well Dot Anko said, unsure of how to tell her about what happened. He's not dead, if that's what you're wondering Kakashi added. So he's okay then Tenten asked. Not really. Dot dot well, he cut Naruto's hand off and it can't be put back on. He. He may have to stop being a ninja Anko said quietly. Tenten started crying and Anko put her arms around her in a rather awkward hug since she wasn't really used to doing this kind of thing. SHHH she whispered to Tenten, it's not your fault. You did everything just the way you were supposed to. Bakashi put his hand on Tenten's shoulder and said, don't worry I'm sure Naruto will be fine. This won't keep him down for long. Anko then resumed talking to Tenten and Kakashi took the still unconscious Naruto to one of the house's guest rooms and then went to talk to his team about what happened. Naruto passed out soon after he collapsed and found himself in his mind right in front of the cage. What just happened? My hand Naruto yelled, waving his stump around. The RR, damn it, hold still the fox yelled out, causing Naruto to immediately cease moving. Now, what happened to your hand? The guy with the sword, Zabuza, see he cut my hand off. Hayubi's eyes widened. She did a quick scan of Naruto's body and found that not only had his hand been cut off, but that he would bleed to death long before they got back to the village. She quickly sent some of her chakra to the wound and used it to halt the bleeding. Alright, I've slowed the bleeding down. You won't bleed to death anymore. So what do I do now he asked. Well, I don't really know. Had it been severed differently I could probably put it back on, but with the way it was cut, I can't. What? You will only have one hand for the rest of your life. What? How am I gonna be a ninja with only one hand? Oh, you can get another hand, but it won't be yours. They make artificial hands for people like you. They do? Yes. I do not know how they control them, but they function just like a regular hand does, as far as I have noticed. When you get back to Konoha, talk to the old man. You mean Jai-chan? Okay. But what do I do until then? I do not know. As soon as you get ready for one of the artificial ones, I will fix your arm so that you will get the most benefit out of it. Until then, I will keep some of my chakra there so that you will not feel pain, especially if you were to bump into something with it. But won't Kakashi and Anko sensei be able to sense the chakra? Possibly, if Inu asks about it, you should probably tell him about me. I don't think he really knows much yet. Anyway, you need to rest now. Inu drugged you after the battle, so you won't wake up until morning. Where did he take me? From what I have been able to gather, we are at the home of the old drunk. Oh. Okay. Sleep now. You need to rest. As soon as Kakashi walked into the living room, Sakura assaulted him with questions. Kakashi sensei, what's going on? Where are Naruto and Tenten? What's up with your eye? Why aren't you saying anything? Sakura shut up Kakashi side out, preventing her from asking more questions. He dropped himself into a chair before continuing. Naruto and Tenten are in the kitchen right now. Tenten is waking up, and Midarashi-san is finishing up bandaging Naruto's arm. To my eye, it was a gift dot from a friend. Is Naruto going to be okay? I don't know Sakura. It's too early to tell. Provided it doesn't get infected or anything, Naruto will live, but whether or not he remains a shinobi won't be determined until we get back to the village. Sakura had asked a few more questions that night, but Tsunami soon showed them to their rooms, and they all went to bed, with Sakura in one room, Sasuke and Sai in another, and Naruto and Tenten in with the senseis, so they could be watched over. The next morning, Kakashi, despite suffering from moderate chakra exhaustion, took his team out into the woods for training, and left Anko with hers to recover and watch the house. 
Once he had his team going, Kakashi watched over Tazuna at the bridge. Denton woke up long before Naruto did, and she and Anko talked quietly for a while, mainly about Naruto's situation. When he finally did wake up, it was almost noon. Boy, rat, it's about time you woke up. The sensei, where are we he asked, still fighting the effects of the medication. We're at Tazuna's house. More importantly, how are you? He was silent for a while, okay, I guess. Well, don't let it get you too down brat. They make things just for people who lose limbs so they can keep functioning. Hell, there are Sunanins who do that intentionally. Really he asked. Uh huh, I don't really know much about how they work, but the replacement limbs function just like normal ones, so once you get used to it, you shouldn't have any problem staying a ninja. Naruto just let out a huge sigh of relief. He didn't really have any other skills he could support himself with if he wasn't a ninja, especially if he only had one hand. He put his right hand against his stomach and said quietly, she's helping too. Anko raised an eyebrow, and Tenten asked, what do you mean? She's keeping some of her chakra in my arm to keep out infection, and to lessen any pain I feel if I bump into it or something. I just wanted to tell you in case you sensed her chakra. Hmm, I can't feel it, and Kakashi didn't say anything this morning, so he either didn't notice, or doesn't think it's dangerous, but I'll tell him when he gets back tonight. Naruto propped himself up, and finally got a good look at Tenten. Her right cheek was swollen, and she had a black eye. What happened to you he asked. Zabuza hit me she replied quietly. Hey? Are you okay he asked, already ignoring the fact that he was far more wounded than she was. I'll be fine. I just have to wait a little while for the swelling to go down. By mid-afternoon, both Jenin were out of bed and moving, and Anko already had them training again. Anko and Tenten were working on some strategy exercises, and Naruto was trying to figure out how much his chakra control had fallen with the loss of his hand, since he couldn't really form seals anymore. The results weren't promising. His control had dropped by almost a third, which for someone who didn't have the greatest control to begin with, was a pretty serious problem. He could still perform jutsu, it just took more chakra, since he couldn't mold it properly. He knew that most got to the point that they could do many of the simpler jutsu without hand seals, as they had memorized the way the chakra had to be molded, and could do that in their head. Naruto just decided that he would have to train himself to do the same thing, just as a genin. He also realized that he might not be able to continue to train with his current set of weapons, since bows and staffs require two hands to operate. Oh well, I'll worry about that later, I guess. Right now I have to figure out how to mold my chakra without hand seals. Trying to figure out just how bad his control was, he tried to walk up the wall, a skill Anko had taught him and Tenten months ago. Before leaving for the waves, he had gotten to the point where standing on a wall was almost second nature, and only required a minimum of concentration. Now though, he could barely do anything else. It took almost all of his attention just to stay on the wall, and all of it to move. Boy brat, feeling better already Anko asked, looking up from the exercise she was running with Tenten. Naruto turned to answer her, but his focus was split enough to cause him to fall off the wall, landing face first on Tenten's bed. He eventually moved to a sitting position and said, not really. I can't even walk on the damn wall anymore. Seeing Naruto's depressed look, Anko said, "Hey, don't let it get to you. Once we get back to the village we'll get you all straightened out. Anyway, get over here and tell me what you would do in this situation. Naruto hoisted himself off the bed and went over to see what Anko was showing him. He looked at the scenario for a second and then just said drawn shocking both of the girls. What? Why would you run? Naruto just glared at Anko for a second before motioning to his missing hand. Oh, right. Uh, okay, tell me what you would do if that hadn't happened. Well, I'd probably. 